Hello, everyone, and welcome to another edition of Mormon Stories Podcast. I am your host, John DeLynn. It's May 30th, 2023, and we are here for part three of our epic interview with podcaster Bill Reel. Hey, Bill. How are you? And Amanda Reel. Hi, good morning. And I'm here joined by my uh, lovely and brilliant partner in truth and righteousness, Margie. Hey, Margie. Hey there. Uh, For those who didn't join us for parts one and two, Part one was about Bill's uh, upbringing as a convert to Mormonism at age 17 and uh, his rapid ascent to uh, becoming a Mormon bishop by age 29. Uh, We talked a bit about Amanda's uh, Mormon upbringing as well and her meeting Bill and uh, their early marriage together. And then we talked about how a Mormon bishop could end up listening to Mormon Stories podcast as a Mormon bishop which led to Bill uh, becoming a Mormon-themed podcaster himself. And that's kind of uh, uh, how part one ended, with Bill asking to be released as a bishop and and, uh, wanting to become a a Mormon podcaster. Part two took uh, took it from there, from his uh, ending as a Mormon bishop through his eventual, and kind of him carrying the torch as a faithful, progressive Mormon podcaster, uh, carrying that torch until the wheels started to come off the wagon for him a bit, faith-wise, and he started to question the sincerity uh, and the ethics of the top Mormon church leadership, uh, which led to him criticizing, crossing the line that I crossed at some point and criticizing top Mormon church leadership, specifically Jeffrey R. Holland, which led to his a disciplinary council and eventually an excommunication, uh, which was how we ended part two yeah. of our interview. So part three, uh, the theme for today, we're going to do about a two and a half hour uh, discussion today. Uh, it's going to be part part stories, but part discussion. Um, Today, we're going to be covering Bill and Amanda's reconstruction after Mormonism and what all that has meant. We're going to be talking about death. We're going to be talking about relationships. We're going to be talking potentially about drugs, uh, because that's a topic that Bill, Bill and Amanda both feel very passionately about. So content warning, uh, we may be talking about sensitive topics that for some are um, concerning and for others they're very passionate about. I don't know if we're going to be talking about sexuality or not, but we're going to be talking about many of the topics that post-Mormons end up exploring or thinking about. And we're going to be talking about religion and the role of religion and what you do post-religion and maybe even we'll be talking about humanity and the human species and uh, the role religion plays. But then is there is there something that can be created post-religion that maybe helps to meet all the needs that the churches and religions played, but in a way that doesn't come with as much baggage? Are we going to do all that in two and a half hours, Bill? I hope we can cover all of that. That all sounds beautiful. <laughs> uh, Amanda, thanks for joining us. Hope you're feeling all right. I'm doing great. Thank you for having me. Yeah. And tonight we're going to be hosting a special event where we're going to have a bunch of uh, friends and fans of Bill and Amanda come and honor honor them. Uh, so we're excited about that. And we'll hopefully record that as well and maybe share that Love it. Um, at some point. Margie, you ready for this? I'm ready. Yeah? Excited. Yes. All right, Bill. It's your time. Where should we begin? So let's, let's set a little bit of groundwork. Um, inside religion... Assuming that folks are either beginning to deconstruct or have reconstructed some life outside, if we're going to talk about that, we need to talk about religion as a form of tribalism. And so religion, in my mind, does uh, a few things that I consider to be unhealthy to individual well-being, uh, but for which, if I'm honest, religion is a, a tool that passed along technology and other tools that we may be tampering with by kind of pulling people out of that, right? Like by helping people deconstruct religion and them discarding it, they are losing things. And Britt Hartley uh, has been a a huge help to me to, to lean into owning that religion does have value, 
that while it might do a lot of unhealthy things, it also in ways causes us to pause and stare out at the universe at a macro level as well as a micro level. It calls on us to uh, come together to serve others in hard moments, uh, even if that service sometimes seems superficial or a form of sympathy rather than empathy. And so the things that I see that religion does that are unhealthy, religion others people. So religion is always an insider-outsider club, and the insiders are good and the outsiders are bad. And what that does is it allows you to label people who are different than you uh, as less than, as the bad guys. Uh, It justifies uh, uh, crimes like genocide within religion. It justifies any uh, unfair treatment of others who are outside the tribe. Two other things that I think religion does inside uh, is that religion uh, values the tribe's perpetuation over the well-being and contentment and happiness of the individual. And uh, religion also uh, values the ego of the authoritative voices within the tribe rather than the well-being of the individual. And I think it's important to establish that because we, you know, we in this arena of putting out content to help people in this process are often criticized as taking people out of religion and not giving them something else. And I, and I think it's, I think it's not fair because even if we don't give them a new system, we've given them the ability to step away from those unhealthy facets that religion was doing. And so setting that as groundwork, I, I guess I would ask if there's any thoughts from you guys, but setting that as groundwork, now we can go into talking about what reconstruction starts to look like and what tools I found or Amanda found that helped us to do that. One thing that's standing out to me about what you're saying is, you know, also as we're shifting, um, moving away from religion uh, during this transition period is this idea of the structure around which religion kind of was the content. And that is like scarcity, It's sort of this idea of like, innately you're not enough, the world is not enough, human beings are not enough without this thing that we're gonna give you. We're gonna give you the answer, right, for all. And a a big part for me was to actually question that. Not so that would play into my worthiness. Do I believe I'm innately unworthy? Do I believe I'm, but also collectively in humanism, do I believe human is like human beings actually fundamentally won't come up with something better? Is it possible that religion actually um, gave these, let's just say complicated, I don't wanna become simplistic about it, but like very complicated answers that played out in ways that were harmful and maybe in the short term offered some, some value to so the tools that you're talking about? Is it possible that without it, we'd come up with better ones? So- yeah. So can I jump in there, Margie, sure. and just lay a bit of groundwork, if it's okay? Yeah. So I, I, I've i done, like, I spent like five or six years doing retreats and workshops mm-hmm. about this. And the way that Natasha and I would always start our retreats is to sort of lay out the value proposition that religions provide. And you've mentioned the book Sapiens as being really crucial yeah. to you. Um, that book was important to me, but I, I was... I've been thinking about this for more than 20 years Mm -hmm. and I'll just, we talked about this in the car. Mm -hmm. So, um, so when I was questioning Mormonism, but also loving it, I stumbled upon, well, actually at BYU, I had a professor introduce me to this author named Kaim Potok and, uh, the Kaim Potok was a Jewish author of the mid 20th century. And he wrote a book called the chosen, the promise, uh, my name is Asher Lev, Davidas Harp. These are four of his most well-known books. And his focus was on Jew- Judaism meets modernity. And he would write fiction, but it was realistic fiction mm-hmm. about like the Jewish people. And on the one hand, you know, millennial, millennia's old religion, um, in some ways religion has been the source of their survival but in another sense, it's been the source of their persecution. So by the late 19th century, Jews uh, are, you know, they've been chased, but pre-Holocaust, they've been chased out of Russia. They've been, you know, pogroms and, and genocide 
is just their history, right? And then they start, you know, because they're also a, a skeptical tradition, a questioning tradition, a learning tradition, um, they start learning about biblical criticism way before David Bakavoy, right? Way before, um, uh, way before, who's the new? Daniel Martin McClellan. Urban, Daniel, Daniel yeah. McClellan. Jews were thinking about biblical criticism in the 1800s, yeah. right? And they discover that maybe the founder of their religion never existed. Maybe yeah. the, the founding myths of their Old Testament never happened. And so this branch of Judaism emerges called Reform Judaism, which, you know, we talked about this, where they're like, well, we can't get rid of our identity. So like religion, what does it provide? Identity, meaning, purpose, community, spirituality, a sense of morals, a whole structure to base society upon the basis of civilization, kind of like a structure for tribalism. And what are we if we're not tribal? Mm. Right. We're monkeys that grouped up into tribes and the myths were like the cohesive glue that these tribes kind of were based on. And that's kind of religion. So Judaism, there's this branch of Judaism called Reformed Judaism that that says consciously we need this religion and it's not true. What do we do? And it's harmful. So Reformed Judaism emerges, which basically says doesn't matter if you believe in God, doesn't matter if you believe in the founder of our religion, Moses, doesn't matter. Like, but we need ritual, we need community, we need spirituality, meaning, purpose, identity, you know, so let's keep being Jews, but beliefs don't matter. Instead of it's belief first, then behavior, then community, or then belonging, let's flip it. Joanna Brooks taught me this. It starts out with belonging first, you just belong. And then if you want to do some of the behavior, great. Do kosher if you want to, but don't do kosher if you don't. Observe Shabbat if you want to, but if you don't want to, you don't have to. And then beliefs are last. They don't matter. That's Reform Judaism. Guess what the large? I, I said this to you in the car. Guess what the largest branch of Judaism in the United States is today? Yeah, and it's Reform Judaism. Reform Judaism. Yeah. So I, when I started, before Mormon stories, I'm starting to think, maybe we need, okay, Mormonism isn't true. I realized that in 2001. But I love my people. I love my tribe. So um, maybe we can start a reform Mormonism. So like when I started the podcast, I had that in my brain, 2005. Like maybe we can start a reform Mormonism, but I don't want to schism. Maybe we can build a reform Mormonism within the church. But it only takes a year or two to realize nobody wants to build it on a foundation of Joseph Smith. For some reason, Jews were okay building on a foundation of Moses and Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. Nobody, once they learn about Joseph Smith's history, want to build a foundation on Joseph Smith. John Hamer left our people, joined Reorganized Church because he's like, you know, you can still build a foundation on Joseph Smith. And that's what Community of Christ is saying. It's like, let's be Christian vaguely, generically, but it's okay to base, you know, on the tradition of Joseph Smith. Um, again, because we need community, spirituality, identity, ritual, all the things. So... Um, but that's, that's kind of, but that, that's fraught with that, that's fraught within Mormonism. Mm -hmm. So, so here we have done this work of helping people get informed consent, learn about the problems. If they aren't with the church now that they feel misled and, and they're not cool with the history, they deconstruct, but then they're left what? These are holes. They're left without identity, without meaning, without community, without purpose, without a resolution for the afterlife, right? Without a clear sense of morality. And and I've seen that be a real struggle for people. And in 2023, I don't know that we've really figured it out. So with that context, let's start with your journey and how you're thinking about all this. Yeah. Yeah. So sapiens did play a major role. Uh, I, I, first off, let me start by saying I accept science. And so I'm, I can't push back against it. That is the most rational way to see the world. Not that it's 100% right. It's always making shifts and changes too. But in any given moment, the collective scientific agreement is where the scientists have all, again, the majority of them, collectively arrived at what is the most rational point of view in that moment. So... 
but I still had some blind spots. And I went back and I read Sapiens. And the first half of the book, most importantly, was just it filled in a lot of those uh, voids that I still had. So I accept that 13 point something billion years ago, something happened. Uh, that's a conversation on its own because we have this idea of of matter is neither created nor destroyed. And scientists agree it came from this small thing and then turned into everything around us. And it's an expanding universe. And none of that makes any sense at all. But from that moment forward, there was a creative energy that was expanding in the universe and everything came from it. And if I go to the point where something close to human arrives on the planet, we, we have to recognize that humans acting as individuals will die. If, if a human being or whatever was less than human but on the way to being human tried to survive on its own, it almost certainly wouldn't. And so the human species is not fast enough or strong enough to survive on its own against ferocious, faster animals. Hence, the only way humans survive is by banding together, collaborating. Um, and, and in order to collaborate, we talked in the car about how you have to have trust with each other. And Sapiens taught me that in really small groups, intimacy worked. If there was 12 of us, we would all know each other well enough to know who the good hunter was, who the good gatherer was, who the really flawed hunter was that you didn't want to take on the hunting trip, who the really bad gatherer was that would pick the wrong berries or mushrooms and we'd all just uh, pass away from. Or steal the food. Right. You know, or stab you in the back or whatever. Totally. Right. And so in the effort to work together and to perpetuate Obviously, bigger tribes slaughter smaller tribes. And so any mechanism or adaptation that allows a bigger tribe to collaborate in a way that is just as successful as the smaller tribe would then allow that tribe to then dominate over a smaller group of people. Once you get over the number of about 25 people, Yuval Harari suggested that humans invented this technology called language. And earlier uh, primates, and still in the primate world today, bonobos and gibbons and gorillas and all of that, chimpanzees, they do this act of grooming. So they'll get together every day with each other and pick gnats out of each other's hair and be able to work together because that signals to each other that I care about you and I'm here for you. And it's how we kind of, they learn, it's how they learn to trust each other and understand their roles within the uh, primate family or the primate tribe that they're in. But again, bigger tribes slaughter smaller tribes, and human beings don't do the grooming thing, at least not anymore. What we do is with language as a tool, we also then created another adaptation from language called gossip. And we think of gossip today as like speaking bad about somebody, but gossip 200,000 years ago would have been the way that I tell you about other members of the tribe and their gifts and flaws. So it's how when you're in a tribe larger than 25, where you can't possibly know intimately each other, and this works up to about 150 people, where gossip serves as the tool that we all kind of collaborate together because we all know our strengths and weaknesses. And even though I know Amanda, but Amanda doesn't know John, but I do, I can now inform Amanda about John and tell uh, Amanda what his gifts and flaws are. But again... Bigger tribes slaughter smaller tribes. And so once you get to 150 and more, the, the mechanism that we created as human beings as a technology is myth. And one only has to read Joseph Campbell or um, other folks who have written on that topic to understand that myth is so powerful that somebody can be a complete stranger to you, but because you both hold the same belief and not always religious nationality. So if I'm in a war and the, there are two people on the battlefield and one is wearing the same uniform as me and somebody else is wearing a different uniform, I know who the good guys are and I know who the bad guys are. For tribes to survive, it depends on the tribe essentially being one life form. And individual well-being isn't important. And you have to get human beings to be brave enough that they will put their life on the line with all of their investment, with all of their intention and energy. Otherwise, the other tribe that is doing that will kill you. So your responsibility as a tribe is to create a belief system 
that people go, I've got a resolution for death. I don't have to worry about dying. I know that I will live beyond that because that's the that's really a, a core component of how you get someone to sacrifice their life on the battlefield. It's the whole idea that there's no atheist in the foxhole. Because if you think that your life will end the moment you are shot, there is something within you that's going to want to bail on being on the front lines of that battle. And so believers in a religion, even if the religion is to most people absurd, is still going to get the believer to sacrifice themselves in the name of the tribe. And hence, myth is so powerful in doing that. Um. I, I guess I maybe I want to stop for a moment and just check in and see if there's a spot you want to go from there. Cause I don't know that I addressed Margie and maybe not even addressed per se you, but I think people need to understand what religion solves religion. Um, again, it has a morality, but it's not an individual morality. It's not like we go, what is really ethical in terms of treating people good and bad. It's really more of a code of conduct. So we don't disrupt each other too much as a community and lose trust in each other. And so some of the rules aren't really fair. They're really more about the tribe working together rather than the individual being safe and secure. Does yeah. that make sense? Yeah, it's about arranging order to the benefit of the group. At sometimes for the best, and it's uh, there's a tension there because it's to the benefit of the individual in the sense that, that hopefully the individual survives when they otherwise will be killed by other mm -hmm. tribes. But in the other sense... The, the individualistic needs of the individual are always going to ultimately be subservient or relegated, you know, as less important to the needs of the group. So there's always going to be, as Bonner Ritchie said once, there's always going to be violence done to the individual because at the end of the day, the, the group, the group needs to survive over the individual. Yeah. Um, it, and, and, and to the extent that if we back up in time and still today in countries with unrest to the degree where um, folks are really in danger on a daily basis and don't really have the freedom to express themselves, uh, it, it is crucial that the system be set up uh, in that way to perpetuate the tribe. If we're going to start gearing towards individual well-being – it can only happen in environments where everyone already to a certain degree feels safe and secure. So as we're talking about reconstructing and setting tribalism off to the side and trying to create something where individuals matter most, um, we need to honor that that is a privilege. Like you only can do that in places where there's a certain amount of privilege that already exists. Mm -hmm. And that even in places where that exists, it could crumble at any moment and we might have to resort back to tribalism. Uh, Thomas McConkie once told me, I, I did an interview with him where we talked about the stages of cognitive development and he made this remark. He said, Whatever we were in the past, there was a moment in time where we were all collectively egocentric. We only cared about ourselves. And then we became family-centric. And then we became ethnocentric or tribal. And as much as all of us on the other side of religion see ethnocentricity as unhealthy, his comment was, but pause for a moment. Recognize that when ethnocentricity came on the stage, it likely saved the human race. And so it kind of plants in us that idea that one stage isn't better than another. There is a hierarchy. There is a progression from lower stages into higher stages. But there isn't a good or bad. Some of these stages that we look at as being bad were the best thing that could have happened to the human species at the time they did. And so as we're, as we're conversating about being in, uh, privileged and being able in this moment in 2023 in America to begin to talk about how we create a society that values individual well-being, safety, security, contentment. This is a complex conversation that we could be entirely wrong on. Does that make sense? Oh, makes all the sense in the world. Because num number one, like, and I think about this little, I've been thinking about this every day for 20 years. And that's, that's not to say I've got better thoughts. It's just like I'm 
This is all I think about because I like, I care about humanity. I care about human suffering and I care about our species in a sense. I want to see us. I mean, I don't like the harm that we do to each other and to the world on the one hand, but I also have pride in our species and want to see us do well and maybe even do better. So, um, so I am constantly thinking about, well, number one, I start with this conditioning that Mormonism was good for me. So like I, we talked yesterday about how your mom was in foster care. You didn't feel like you got what you needed when you were growing up, love and nurturing you, you know, but then when you found missionaries or found Amanda and found the church and then got into it, it starts developing you and challenging you in ways that you may not have been able to find on your own. Mm. Right. Mm. Um, and like that, uh, I think that many, many, many in, it, it, give stipulating the harm that religion has caused and conti is, continues to cause. That's the price of tribal thriving if what we just said 10 minutes ago is true. In other words, if we're going to survive and not get snuffed out by the other tribe, then yeah, there's going to be a cost of the individuals sometimes being harmed for the benefit of the group. But if that's true, and religion is sort of what brought us to the dance, if religion brought us to 2023 to where, hey, we're all kind of thriving so well that we can consider putting off the tribe, which is kind of where we are, we're almost it's almost like a faith crisis is a privilege where we've advanced to the point intellectually, socially, financially, where we can go, maybe I don't need the tribe anymore. 200 years ago, you know, you know what the saying, right? A lone monkey is what? A dead monkey. Yeah. Like 500, 1,000 years ago, you just decide you don't need your tribe. If your tribe doesn't kill you, the other tribe will. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So now religion has got us to the point where we're like, ah, oh, maybe I don't even need the tribe. But then the question is, number one, are we really going to be better off without it? Or are we going to get lost like a lone monkey psychologically if if there isn't a threat of some tribe killing us? Is there the threat of our own minds killing us? Is there the threat of just meaninglessness or existential dread or just being left to our own devices without a grounding moral force? Are, are we individually going to do better or worse and then secondly, will our will our species do as well? Will our community do as well? Or will our community fare worse? And that's what I'm thinking about all the time. And in 2023, I wish I could say, oh, yeah, leave religion and you're going to just thrive for sure. And our species is going to just do way better. I'm not convinced individually or as a species after interacting with tens of thousands of people who have left their religion, I'm not convinced that more often than not, we don't end up making a bigger mess for ourselves individually, causing more suffering to ourselves individually than whatever pain we would have experienced in the religion. I'm not sure. Yeah. And then with a bigger, bigger concern, I'm not sure that as a species, if we throw off religion and get rid of it, we're better off in a hundred years than what brought us to the dance, which was religion and shared myth. Okay, go. No matter how much we turn the society into uh, one that favors individual well-being, we're going to need to have if we're if we live in a world where there are geographic boundaries and there are bad guys out there. In other words, unhealthy, powerful people who threaten our existence, such as Putin and Russia right now. And so we have to have a military that is willing to put its life on the line at any given moment. We have to be so determined to survive that we have to have the best tools and technology to destroy them if need be so that they don't destroy us. And if we create a society of people who discard God, and discard the unhealthiness of a religious tribe, 
then you've got to bet your bottom dollar that that's going to also have ramifications for the intensity upon which a military is built and can engage an enemy. Um, we, we, we live in um, a world right now that's in transitions. In other words, we're trying to have a conversation about the other side of something that we're in the middle of right now. So some data is coming back, at least for me, I would say this is sort of anecdotal, although I've tried to survey folks like in Southern Utah, for instance, and you've done this work as well, where you're getting feedback from people who have deconstructed religion and you're checking in on them to see how they're doing. They're reporting back on how life is going. And what seems like happens is the deconstruction of religion is traumatic. It is the dark night of the soul. But on the other side of that, once people get some footing and grounding, most of them seem to report that they are as happy or, to a large extent, happier than they were. Not everyone. We talked about that yesterday. But also some results are coming back and showing that children, for instance, suffer more from depression, the more softness that their home has, the more free time they have to think about things. There's something beneficial to fighting for your life every day to the point where people in extreme poverty in underdeveloped countries or in developing countries um, seem to not deal with the depths of depression as people who seem to have their basic needs taken care of and free time to think about it. And so I think we're in this transitional moment where we don't yet know the answer. And we have to kind of step out into the shadows a little bit, and we might have to sort of test these ideas and be willing to make adjustments if if the data shows that things aren't healthy. And I think the results as of right now are both good and bad. So maybe one way we could frame our conversation today, what I like to do is describe this phenomenon of leaving religion as, as having all these holes emerge. Again, identity, spirituality, morality, community, um, resolutions about the afterlife, yeah. et cetera, right? Should we start with Those each are the one? holes. And, and the question, I, the, what I tell people is when they come to me with the faith crisis, I'm like, have you identified the holes that have developed since you've left your high demand religion and how have you filled them? So one thing we can do is just talk to you guys about how you look at each of these mm -hmm. holes and how you have thought about filling them yeah. and, and what's worked and what hasn't. So should we start with the first one, identity? Sure. Yep. So when I was in a uh, philosophy class in college, most folks who have delved into philosophy uh, and delved into kind of religions of the world will grasp this. But in this was in the section on Buddhism, actually, and they, they were having a conversation about who we are. And they talked about, you know, if I cut off your arm, are you still you? And the answer is yes. If I cut off your legs, are you still you? Yes. If I cut off, if I have a, a sheet over you and I cut you off from the neck and below and somehow machines are allowed to keep you alive and you don't know yet that your entire neck down is gone. And the doctor comes in and goes, hey, how are you doing? You're going to go, I'm doing great. Life is good. Super excited to be here. I'm glad the surgery went well or whatever. You don't recognize yet that everything about you is missing. In your brain, you understand that you are still you. So no piece of you or part of you is taken away. And then, then the next thing is, are you your thoughts? And we recognize that thoughts come and go. Some of them we sort of sense we can choose to go into. But now there's this debate about free will and even... Uh, even those on the forefront of science who say that free will does exist, they agree that it is extremely limited, uber limited to the point that it is essentially no free will anyway. So you're not your thoughts. And so what are you? You're the observer behind the eyes and that's it. You're simply the observer and you get this time frame of life to observe all these moments passing in front of you. And, and you don't quite grasp it, but you think of past and future. Again, um, animals do the same behaviors we do. They just don't apply stories to it. And so we were talking yesterday just at, a, at lunch or dinner, talking about how I saw kangaroos fighting. And it looked like a bar fight. 
These guys were duking it out, but they didn't have a story about things. So we apply stories to things and uh, we have consciousness or at least something we call consciousness. And that consciousness calls us to reflect on the past and the future as if they are with us in the present. And it's not real. The past is just a memory and the future never comes. The, all you have is the here and now. And so identity on the reconstruction side for me is that I really am none of the things I think I am. And, and hence, I, I shouldn't have allegiance to any of it. My, my goal in terms of my identity is to constantly try to show up in a way that I'm improving upon what happened before so that I can be my best, healthiest self and be accountable to my, my bullshit, be accountable to uh, my unhealthy mechanisms and find a way to treat other human beings as if they were me. We were talking last night at dinner. There's a, a really cool YouTube series called Soft White Underbelly. And this guy interviews what most of us look at as the dregs of society, prostitutes, drug dealers, gambling addicts. And all the guy does is put him in front of a camera and he says, share your life with me. He basically does Mormon stories for folks uh, on the back alleyways of Las Vegas. And as he's having the conversation, which you realize within a couple of episodes, then they're short, they're seven to 20. Once in a while, there'll be a 40 minute conversation, but most of them are in the 15 to 20 minute range. In that range, you realize very quickly that these human beings really are you under a different set of circumstances. And so while religion others people, the, the, uh, the, the woke side, and, I, and you and I, you know, we talked about that word being problematic because there's, there's ills to wokeism as well. But the waking up to things as they really are is it's nudging us or compelling us to sense that every human being is us. And as Eckhart Tolle, I think I said it yesterday, that we are the universe expressing ourselves as a human for a little while. That creative energy created everything and we are it. And so while religion taught us to see ourselves as separate and coming into the world, the reality is we're not separate. We are each other and we are the plants and we are the animals and we are the rocks. And, and we ought to see other people as ourselves. And only in doing that do you become inclusive and you stop caring about right and wrong and good and bad, but you start to think of ethical and unethical. You start to think of responsible and irresponsible. And you start framing the world in a different way that you care about people as yourself, and you want them to have the same opportunities, the same protections, the same safety, and the same opportunity to seek their fullest selves of contentment with, with the only rule being that we work our butts off to, to, to remove as much as we can. And I should say this, trauma is part and parcel, a part of this life. You can't be born into this world and you can't give birth to someone in this world without incurring trauma. So trauma is a necessity, but we ought to work our butts off to reduce intentional harm and unnecessary trauma so that people can live their best lives possible and othering people is never going to get there. So you started approaching the topic of identity. Yeah. And, I am I am everything. And what you're saying is we are everyone. We are we, everyone we are and everything. each other. We are one. We are all one. Everything's one. Yeah. This is you know, this is like John Lennon's Imagine song that the world may be as one. Everyone that I've talked to that has had kind of a psychedelic experience, which we've covered a little bit on Mormon stories, that's kind of one of the most common epiphanies. And if you even look at like Jesus and what he taught, it seems like there's a oneness to humanity that Jesus seemed to be preaching. So, so for you, but, but what, what the tension there is, is it, it's basically saying the erosion of a tribal identity, the erosion of, I am my worth. And I'm Margie, I want to get your thoughts in here. 
I, you know, in Mormonism, it's like, I'm a Mormon. I'm a member of the Church of Jesus Christ. I'm a father. I'm a mother. I'm a priesthood holder. I'm a deacon. I'm a teacher. I'm a priest. I'm endowed. I'm a missionary. I'm a bishop. I'm an elder. I'm a Relief Society president. I'm, you know, I'll be a god someday. Like, I'm, a, you know, it's yeah. like all this story and all this identity. And... And then I'm my behaviors. I'm worthy or I'm not worthy. I am a masturbator. I'm a I'm an adulterer or I'm I'm a worthy person, right? And you're saying for you, throw all that away, and it's just I am, and it's I am one with everything. So no more identity. But then that uh, that answers the, that begs the question, sort of of what about the tribe? You know, and and. And is that an identity, just being one with everything? Is that enough for people? Yeah, it seems as though every th again, taking all of that logic to its end, everything is myth. It's all made up. It's all pretend. I think of like the financial system. We started out by finding some metals in the earth, and we called them gold and silver, and we decided that they were more valuable than the others. And so I accumulated my gold and, and you agreed that my gold was worth something and I agreed that my gold was worth something. So we did a trade. I got some goods and gave you a piece of gold. And at some point, gold went away and we had money, but money was based on gold that we didn't see that was hidden away somewhere. And then that gold just kind of vanished, didn't it? And suddenly there was money, but now we created, the money got put off to the side and now we created these plastic cards and these pieces of paper called checks. And now most of the money is gone as well. And then the money just disappears. And then now we create uh, the internet and we transfer money electronically. And I put a routing number in and an account number and I can send you thousands of dollars. And now there's no more paper checks. And now the cards aren't being used as much. And it all slowly fades away. It's all myth. It's all made up. But myth is valuable in, in the same way that there are things we have to sort of pretend in. And we might be able to choose which myths we uh, emphasize, and some myths are better than others, but almost assuredly, inevitably, we're going to have to create, if we're going to create something better, it's going to have to have some form of myth in order to bind people together and to lead them to trust each other so that we can have collaboration, reciprocity, fairness, trust, because if we're, because any good society is going to be built on those kinds of things. And so we're going to have to here figure out what myth we create that can get a world society to trust each other in spite of geographic differences, skin color differences, cultural differences, language differences. There's quite a feat ahead of us. And yeah. as we said, I don't even know if we get there. Yeah. Yeah. And I should add a credit to Noah, Rashida, and secular Buddhism and just Buddhism in general, this idea of... We're not our stories. We're not our labels. Uh, you know, we're not our actions. We're not our behaviors. Um, we just are. We're the we're the we're the consciousness behind the thoughts and the feeling. We're not our feelings. We're not our trauma. This idea that we are simply observers of what's around us, um, and that we're kind of one with everything. It. It's, it kind of starts with Buddhism, doesn't yeah. it? And, and let me say, too, my – again, everyone's well, welcome to disagree. My belief is that humans – each human being is doing the best that they can. You and I were talking uh, yesterday uh, about, uh, unfortunately, the idea of serial killers or pedophiles. Um, there is genetics involved in that. The science says that the unhealthiest among us – are genetically predisposed to think the thoughts that they think, and they have the same difficulty in uh, doing the healthy thing that you and I have about whatever it is that, that our brains tell us to indulge in. So if my thing is I've got to have chocolate ice cream, and lots of us do, recognize that the most unhealthiest humans around us are also predisposed to think those unhealthy thoughts in the same way that we can't control exactly all of our behaviors. And hence, when you grasp that all humans are just trying to, um, all humans are doing the best they can, regardless of the degree of healthiness or unhealthiness that's within them, you got to find ways to stop, I guess, punishing people 
you can try to in a sort reform people, but the but the the goal now instead of inflicting pain so that you pay a price for what you did is really how do I keep the unhealthy mechanisms of each of us from impacting the innocent people around us. And hence, it, it's a whole nother way of creating a moral code. It's a whole nother way of designing rules. It's a whole nother way of creating myth stories to uh, ingrain important in uh, societal uh, principles within. And again, we're right in the middle of, and maybe we're in the beginning of this process of trying to figure out even how to do that. Margie, do you have any thoughts on Bill's reflections on identity? I'm just curious. Like, does that seem solid for you, the idea that we're all one and that labels and stories and tribal identity aren't going to get us where we need to go in the future? I have a question for you about mm -hmm. that. How, how has that, however you want to talk about it, um, that thought that you hold, that idea that you hold, how has that affected your life, your relationships, yeah. your relationship you know, with your family. I'm just kind of curious about yeah. that. Every one of us, whatever trauma happened to us in our life, those moments where something threatened us and we were scared, in, in that happening, we've developed um, mechanisms. I'll call it and I think they call it shadows, right? Like we have this, these shadows, which are something happened and we created this underlying way in which to put walls up around ourselves and protect ourselves. So that when something now in the future looks like that thing, our walls go up and we now manipulate the outside world so that we get to feel safe and secure. So if Amanda says something that triggers me, um, I say something back, which is designed to put her at distance from me so that she can't uh, poke it at my really fragile parts and pieces. Um, so what you're pointing to, Margie, is that me coming to grasp that, uh, that I'm just the observer, that I've taken on secular Buddhism, I begin to lean into the fact that I shouldn't have any attachment to all of that, which allows me then to look in the mirror and to confront the unhealthy aspects of myself without needing to put my walls up. So now for the first time, the last five years, for the first time in my life, I've been willing to sit in space with people that I've hurt and hear honestly their reflection of like, hey, here's the things you do when the world isn't the way you want it to be. When you are grasping at things trying to make the world what you want it to be, or you're pushing away things that are in your space that you don't want, you're hurting the rest of us in the way that you do that. And so for the first time in my life, I'm able to look in the mirror and go, oh, you're right. I'm doing those things. I'm protecting my ego. I'm protecting myself at others' expense. And they're me. Hence, I ought to concern myself with protecting them and giving them safety and security in the same way that I want it. Hence, I shouldn't use unhealthy mechanisms to distance myself from accountability. I shouldn't use unhealthy mechanisms to uh, protect myself at the expense of causing harm or trauma to someone else. And I think that's a whole nother way of living out a life. Yeah, I can see that. Yeah. So let's go to maybe a second uh, hole to fill. Let's do spirituality. What is, yeah. like a lot of Mormons, post-Mormons become allergic even to the word spirituality. They associate it with abuse and with trauma and with manipulation and, and with religion. And with woo. Yeah. And with religion. Yeah. So what are your thoughts on spirituality? And, and if you still hold a place for something like or called spirituality, what does that look like? Yeah. So I separate completely the words religion and spirituality. We all remember those tests in school that would be designed to gauge our intelligence and we would have logic questions. You know, all apples are fruits and all fruits glow. And then you had to mark the box that say apples glow, right? And we all connect the dots. Even if, even if it's an absurd statements such as I just said, 
we recognize that the flow of it is still logical. Um, spirituality, religion has spirituality. Religion is a controlling way to get the tribe to collaborate together. And on some level, it convinces its, its uh, followers that they are having, and they do have a spiritual, have spiritual experiences. Um, spirituality though, doesn't necessitate religion. So this is maybe where drugs come in. If I go back 200,000 years ago, whatever we were, we were certainly interacting with conscious altering tools. But rather than having a religious authoritative voice who said, hey, I know how this works for all of you. Here's, here's what's on the other side. I'm the voice for that. You all believe me. He told me the rules. I'll tell you. Instead, there was a shaman who had us interact with conscious altering tools, and everybody was permitted to go off and have their own experience. And so the shaman in medicine tools is there to help each person have their own journey. And your journey will be completely unique to everyone else in the room. And somewhere along the way that got sabotaged and the person at the, in power, in a position of power said, oh, what if I control the narrative and I say that what I experienced or what I would like people to believe is experienced, I impose as the way it is for all of you. And so when I did ayahuasca, there was, um, there was a group of us in a room and we all took the medicine and the shaman did these rituals and he had this, he had this table set up and he had candles on it and he had, he blew tobacco into the air. Um, and he asked everyone to come forward and take the medicine. And I, I raised my hand and I said, tell me about this. What, what does this ritual mean? And he said, to be honest, I don't know. You figure it out. And I thought that was gorgeous. Like you could tell it was spiritual. You could tell it was setting the groundwork for us to internally sense that something big was about to happen. The environment's going to change here. But he didn't tell me what I was supposed to make meaning of it. So I take the medicine and within an hour, I am off on my own journey. And there are people in the room who are in their head literally on a raft, falling off and drowning in the water and trying to survive. There's another person who's going back into their early childhood and dealing with sexual abuse. There's another person who's talking to their dead grandmother who passed away six months ago and meant a whole lot to them. There are folks in the room who are experiencing what they needed. The thing the shaman told us all throughout the two-day event was the medicine is the teacher. The guru isn't some outside voice or person who claims to know things. And in fact, I think the wisest among us recognize that anytime somebody tries to define what it is, they got way closer than they were ever meant to be, and you automatically already know they're wrong. It's the folks who stay at distance and go, it's something, I don't know what it is. There's some connective force among all of us but I'm, I'm not here to tell you what it looks like, how to label it, what the rules are. I don't know. And I think those are the wisest voices in our society. I was curious um, if you wanted to share some of the shifts or insights that have come to you. What I'm hearing you kind of describe a little bit, tell me if I'm getting it right, is, you know, this this switch for away from religion, religion being very external, very much like here's the map, here's what it looks like. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I think there's moments of, you know, a, a structure of connecting to yourself, but also that nothing you get from that experience can be at odds with what the external, you know, power sources, authority are telling you to. So what I'm hearing is where it used to be a very external in nature, right, with religion, moving spirituality, moving toward a connection to yourself, more of an inward journey. Is that what you're kind of saying? Every human being is completely alien to the human being next to them. Somebody said to me, you look at each other. If you just look around a room of people, you can see they all look so different, different color skin, different noses, different ears. Someone said that if you could see the inside of someone's head and the way they think about the world, the way they process what their values are, what they need to be happy, what the things they're drawn to and the things that they detest, 
it would be so much different inside their heads than the differences we perceive in the outer world. And we sense like, it's easy, an easy correlation is like weight loss. For the folks who are trying to lose weight, they're, the best way to do it is to uh, is to create an individualized plan because some people metabolize different than others. Some people need uh, exercise more than others. Other people need certain kinds of diets that are different than the person next to them. And, and we kind of recognize in the weight loss world that there are a thousand ways to do it and some ways are better than others for each individual person. And hence, for me, spirituality is the idea that every human is different from the human next to them, and we ought to find an individualized plan without an outer authority voice saying, this is the plan for all of you, is to create something unique that is appealing to you, that drives you to feel awe and transcendence about the world around you at the macro level, right? We are nothing on a rock arguing with each other about politics and elections and COVID and uh, all the things that we do. And, and meanwhile, it's all meaningless. We're all on this little tiny spot in a map on a tiny little rock floating through space at, you know, whatever miles per hour that is. And whatever we do and bicker about and shoot nuclear weapons at ourselves, it means nothing out there. We're so small. And then if you look at the, the micro level, there is so much going on that you don't even see little, little organisms and plant processes and things happening, mycelium under the, the forest uh, ground floor. And you can't even fathom at the micro level, all the things that are happening. And I think if we're going to be spiritual beings, we ought to look for on transcendence at the macro and micro level. And we ought to, uh, engage in experiences that draw us to be internally accountable to who we are, what we do, that work to shed labels, diminish suffering and harm, and draw us to improve upon who we are so that we make the world and ourselves a better place. And that, to me, is spirituality. Great. Yeah. Thank you for that. So, um, I guess, and we may not have time to delve into it here is I've thought about like spiritual experiences, which is kind of how I thought about spirituality. Mormonism is like having that, the flow, right? The, um, be in the flow, the tingling mm -hmm. of my arms and on down my spine, feeling oxytocin or endorphins or, serotonin or whatever those positive chemicals are that go in my brain. Like whenever I got that in Mormonism, I felt super positive and it's probably not super indistinguishable from like when a mother has a baby, I understand it. When the baby is delivered, the mother feels those rush of similar chemicals or when you're at an amazing concert, you know, but I was taught that those were the Holy ghost and, and it was in a Mormon context but thinking about things evolutionarily, I could see a benefit because if an if a religious organization or a political organization can get you to have those feelings in a religious or a political context, then you feel a sense of allegiance to the group, right? You feel a sense of community with the people around you. You feel a sense of loyalty and allegiance to the group. And um, sometimes... It comes after a, a set of tasks that the religions ask you to do, whether it's praying or reading the Book of Mormon or fasting for a long time. There's a payoff at the end, hopefully, that comes or going to a youth conference or sitting through 12 hours of general conference. Like there's work that you do that that comes before the spiritual experience that's kind of the payoff. And within a traditional cultural societal context, I can see why evolutionarily those spiritual epiphanies developed because they usually have a social context and even a behavioral context that, that um, elicit those experiences. When I talk to my friends who have had psychedelic experiences, it's that there's this isn't a criticism, it's a question. I believe all my friends when they say that it's changed their life. I've, I've almost never met someone who's had a psychedelic experience 
who doesn't say it's changed my life. However, when I've just like said, okay, I knew you before, I know you now, and I've tried to say, huh, do I experience them as a fundamentally different person? Maybe, sometimes yes, sometimes no. Sometimes they seem to be more of a mess sometimes after all these psychedelic experiences than they were before. And one of the questions I had is, what if psychedelics, number one, are simply substances that trigger the feeling or the perception in your brain that you've had a life-changing experience without actually having a life-changing experience or without actually doing the work that would lead to actual change. And so in that sense, it's kind of a shortcut. It can be conceived as a shortcut to get the payoff without doing the work. And, and so sometimes I, so th that's kind of a question I have about psychedelic experiences. Mm -hmm. um, and then the only other thing I'll say is that when they talk about psychedelics, like it's the medicine and the wisdom of the plant or whatever it is, I don't mean to be mocking, mm -hmm. but it starts to <clears throat> pull a, a religious feel to it again. Mm -hmm. of like this mushroom or this thing that I ingested knows all, and it's going to deliver to me the wisdom that I need in the moment. And there almost starts to develop for some this kind of like blind faith again, that somehow this little piece of food that I'm going to eat or this plant that I'm going to ingest knows what's best for me and is going to tell me what I need. When what it might be doing is simply pulling some of the same triggers a dream does. And those those things could be random just as much as they could be deeply meaningful and significant and spiritual. Mm -hmm. We probably don't have time to cover all this. I'm not trying to yuck anyone's totally. yum. I'm trying to be respectful and validating, but also be sincere about yeah. the questions that I have. And I'll add the final thing is, it seems like sometimes people can get addicted to altered states of consciousness, avoid learning to sit with their real mm. distressing emotions that are mm. actually trying to get them to make real changes, mm. but instead psychedelics and other drugs, alcohol, pick your drug, can ultimately become a way that people actually think they're enlightened, but in reality are just avoiding and or developing addictions for themselves. Yeah. Anyway, that's a lot. So- Again, now we're in to do another complex topic that is not cut and dry. So there are people in this world who are using drugs to escape reality and to avoid confronting the challenges that lie in front of them for whatever reasons, for fear and all shame and all the, all the negative feelings that we feel that we want to escape and get away from. But there's also significant data coming in. So for instance, uh, in recent therapy with MDMA, they show that folks who had severe PTSD did three uh, therapeutic sessions with MDMA or Molly, uh, guided by the therapist uh, with some distance in between each session. And when they got done, it was 76% of people, it was 76% of people who uh, said that they're reported back, the data showed that their PTSD was uh, either gone or significantly diminished. And then when they came back and visited those patients a year later, it was like 60, high 60s percent still felt that way. And that's remarkable because with opiates and other medicines, we can diminish PTSD a little bit. We can give people tools to cope with it, but making it essentially vanish has been impossible. So the science says, at least with a segment of people, this thing is working demonstrably. The science, early, early data seems to suggest that it may, like that's different then science has actually established it, right? Yeah, yeah, no, science is always changing, right? New data comes in and-, and I'm just saying it's early. Yeah. It's really early. It is, early. But, the, but the research results seem significant. The other thing is people taking mushrooms and dealing with depression. There's always this risk. There's a small number of people who, when they take conscious altering tools, they're actually at risk. If you are borderline schizophrenic or schizophrenic, you should stay away from any conscious altering tools because you're already struggling 
to discern what reality is, and this is going to complicate that. But for the, but for the far wide majority of folks who take psilocybin, for instance, they're going to have a, a conscious altering experience, and then five hours later, or if it's LSD, 12 hours later, they're going to come out, come out of it and come back to their normal sort of state of mind. But what, what prompts people to make change, like we have this idea that if we teach people and they'll change, and reality is people don't generally change. What does cause changes is when you experience the world in a way that disrupts your current patterns. So there are lots of ways to get there. One of the ways they say is to travel. If you travel and see other places in the world, interact with different cultures, see different people, you are prompted to question, disrupt, and reorganize the patterns of your life, right? Uh, meditation is a big one. Folks who have a meditation practice have that same experience. Folks who are voracious book readers, those folks experience the same sort of thing because they're encountering other people's narratives and stories and realities that are different than their own. Hence, they have to question their own story. Conscious altering tools, as you said, is a shortcut. I can take a, a few mushrooms within 45 minutes to an hour and a half. I am in an altered state of consciousness. But that altered state of consciousness, if used as a tool, because you can go into a drug recreationally and you can go into a tool uh, trying to look into your inner self. And if you take a conscious altering tool, you are suddenly thinking and seeing the world different than you did. Hence, you have no choice but to sort of confront how you were seeing the world and what you're seeing now. And those patterns get disrupted and you get for the first time, whether it's conscious altering tools or meditation or reading a story in a book or going to visit Switzerland, you can sense like, oh, it could be different. It doesn't have to look the way it does. And so I think the you're 100% right about the good and the bad, but I think we can deeply reduce the bad and significantly increase the good if we had a way in which we took conscious altering tools and gave them to people with the education, the environment, and the professional community who were there to guide them through that experience. And I think if we did it appropriately, almost everyone would have a productive experience of some sort, even if they had a bad trip. Amanda, did you want to add something? Um, yeah, I wanted to pipe in, um, you know, maybe for listeners that are, are teetering with, may this be, you know, something for them or not. Um, not everybody has these big epiphanies either. Like, so Bill and I have done the same, the same drugs pretty much at the same time. And so um, as he was speaking to his ayahuasca experience, for example, he had this huge thing. A lot of people learned so much and things like this, as you, you were talking about. And it doesn't happen like that for everybody. I just want to give that caveat. Like, I don't have those big things. Like, I have some visuals and I can play with some visuals and that's fun. But these big epiphany things, I don't get. Um, but also, there's something in my brain I can tell has shifted and maybe it's a placebo effect and I'm okay with that too. I'm okay with shortcuts and I'm okay with placebos. Um, but I don't think... The shortcut does take out the work, though. Um, so, like he said, you've you've now sent something different, and so now I can go and learn about that and build and start um, correcting some things in me. Um, and so, an outsider wouldn't see this big life changing event, and maybe I don't even act differently per se, but I know something's different even if I can't put my finger on it. So now it's my job to go and do the work if I so choose to. But I have not had these big epiphanies like a lot of other people have. Um, so, so maybe don't keep going for the next thing, next thing, if you're looking for that big epiphany, because that might not be how it comes for whatever that's worth. And, and the other side of it is that sometimes these things are huge. You and I did MDMA together, and we were our very first time doing it, had no expectation exactly. We kind of sort of knew what the drug would do. We took it, and an hour later, you and I are in a space where our egos completely dropped off. 
Like there's zero ego. And Amanda is voicing her concerns about our relationship, and I'm voicing my concerns about our relationship. And there is this soft space to just hear the other person, let all your walls down and go like, oh, you're right. I'm doing that. I've never been able to even see that before, more or less be accountable to it. And when we woke up the next morning, it was like we had been through 10 years of therapy And for the first time, I felt like that next day, our relationship was real. Yeah. And so sometimes these experiences can be incredible and lead people to addressing their shadows that they not only couldn't be accountable to, but didn't even know were there. Hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. And is that how much of your thoughts on spirituality then sort of like are now kind of psychedelic, like are now kind of enshrouded within the psychedelic circle? Oh, I just think psychedelics are one shortcut avenue to get there. Um, Most people aren't going to take on meditation. And even most, and even of the group who do take on meditation, most of them give it up quickly, right? It's like exercising. Oh, I'm going to start my new year and I'm going to lose 40 pounds. And literally within a month, 95% of those folks have just gone back to using their treadmill as a coat rack. Hmm. So, so meditation may not be for everyone because it takes work to get to the point where you're experiencing enough success that you can tell the practice is worthwhile. Hence, I shouldn't, I don't think we should shame shortcuts at all if the outward result is still incredible. And pointing out meditation, books, travel, all of those are paths to it. I don't need any one path to be the path. Let's just acknowledge that any process that causes you to bump into your way of thinking and to be able to challenge your own patterns in your head is productive and I think leads to spiritual experiences. Um, so I have a question. So you mentioned kind of travel. What are the other kind of, if we're looking at it like a like a toolbox, yeah. right? And psychedelics would be part of that mm-hmm. toolbox. For you, you said travel. Mm-hmm. Any, like, I would like to hear any of the other kind of tools that you use um, to either reframe or connect to this intention that you said earlier about reducing harm in the world. Mm-hmm. Um, and and also, do you rely on practices at all? Or is it more in, intention for you? Yeah. Uh, one of the things I'm lucky to have around me are really good friends who are also trying to figure out how to be better. And so sitting around with good people, and again, being where I'm at, those people tend to be uh, white, middle-aged. So I also have blind spots where I'm not exposed to differences otherwise. But in the midst of this group of people who have a lot of overlap of similarity, we are more than willing to engage in vulnerable conversations. One of the things religion does is it prevents us from talking openly with each other. There's too much risk. There's too much risk in telling you how my life really is because in religion, there is this judgment that still again leads to othering. You, you either fit in the tribe exactly or you don't. And so there's a psychological mechanism called costly signaling where we're always trying to tell the other person that we belong in this tribe as much as they do. And it really isn't belonging. It's fitting in because every one of us has to wear a mask and compromise ourselves to be there. So sitting around with my friends, we've all edged into this vulnerability. We've started sharing with each other the things that we worried we'd feel shame and fear and judgment about. And then we shared it and it was welcomed. And not only that, then they shared back. And so now there's this ability in the group where there wasn't in religion to talk about real life problems and to talk about like, hey, I seem to be drawn to this sort of behavior. Oh, here I am too. I'm not. I had that I had that issue, but I thought about it differently. And so now these real live conversations take place where I'm allowed to lay my life out on the on the table for everyone to look at and folks can give feedback and share similarities, share differences. What a beautiful opportunity 
to learn about humanity. In the church, when I was a bishop, I did a fireside on sexuality and it was so progressive. I was going to give, I was going to give the whole ward membership room to think about sex outside of the box that Mormonism put them in. Uh, and it wasn't super crazy. It still would have, it would have been super kosher with, with Mormonism, but it would have valued this idea that you don't need to feel shame. Some of the early leaders said that whatever you do in the bedroom isn't anyone else's business. And it would have gotten away from like Spencer W. Kimball saying that oral sex was bad. Because in Mormonism, we sort of sense, we put on our white shirt, we put on our tie, we put on our dresses, and our job is to smile and pretend that everything is good. And there's no way to have a real conversation. And when you find real friends who allow you to be your brand of humanity, you no longer have to compromise yourself and fit in, but you start to really belong. Like, here's me, here's, here's my good, here's my bad, and they go, amen, keep coming. Can't wait to see you. Will you let me be me too? Yep, absolutely. And so suddenly conversations happen where we can share our humanity and begin to really address what's healthy, what's unhealthy, what works, what doesn't work, what tools are you using? What tools are you using? Here's what I'm doing. That to me feels as spiritual as anything in my life. I read a lot, so I love books. I think books are a big key and drugs for me is the other one. I don't travel much. I'd like to travel more. I don't. I don't meditate much. I do a little bit. It feels productive, but I don't have a solid meditative practice. But I don't care what tools you use and which tools you set off to the side and never touch, but find a way to challenge the patterns in your life. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, what I kind of hear you saying, which I feel so similarly about, is just how relationships can be spirituality. Because if if you're really being aware, and that's your intent, is to be aware of how your behavior affects other people, how other people feel, um, right, when they're relating to you, how they're living, and, and that, that kind of sharing, that that becomes this template for reflection. And f- I mean, ideally, for growth, right, to, to kind of shift and change mm-hmm. based on the data you get from the experience that people have of you, yeah. you know? Yeah. Is that what you're saying? I'm hearing that kind of as you share, as well as being seen, coming from this place in religion where so much of us hid different parts of ourselves, right? The, uh, the things that we thought wouldn't be approved of, the things that would devalue us or make us unlovable, that now you've made this shift into doing the opposite, into now showing up more fully for those who value and have earned the right to witness that, you know, in you, um, and that you're finding that to be extremely healing for you. Yeah. How, how could you have been any other kind of human than you are? And anytime you're being something other than you are, you're compromising your authentic self and hence you're hiding yourself. And we have to do that. We live in a world that will not allow us in most spaces to be a authentic or near authentic version of ourself. And when we compromise and try to fit in, it's because we're scared. It's because we're worried of shame, of judgment. The other thing I, I, I would just want to note here is my brain just, I think it works differently than other people. Some folks have the ability to be good listeners and I'm not. I'm not, I'll sit in a conversation with someone and they'll say a thing. And then my brain wants to take the concept and start unraveling it and play with it. And then let's go down this path with it. Let's go down that path with it. And, and then they're still talking and I'm not, my brain isn't listening. My brain's playing with the first thing they said and tinkering with it. And then I'll come back to the conversation two minutes later and I'll, I, I found this really cool idea that I tinkered with and I bring it back to the conversation and go, what about this? but I've, I've lost this moment with them. I think we ought to recognize that all of us are so different in how we think that everyone brings gifts and flaws to the relationship. And how can humans, how could humans be any different than different and bumping into each other a little bit and meshing a little bit? And some people are very different and don't mesh at all. And we all pick and choose like, oh, I can, I really enjoy uh, this person's personality. This person's really abrasive. So I put distance. We have to sit with people who are different and to respect those differences, such a learning environment too. 
Um, there's really cool stuff happening if we sit and be present with it. And while I, when I go to a party, I often, because I'm an introvert, I'll often sit in the back and I'll just kind of watch everyone. And it's such a neat thing. Everyone kind of branches into these groups of three to five and they talk for a little bit and then someone steps away and someone else steps in and someone steps away and someone else steps in. And there's this really cool thing happening where people are going like, hey, let me open up and show you my insides and see if I'm allowed to be in this space. There's just really cool social things going on. If we'll sit and just listen to people better and recognize some people maybe don't listen as well, but they bring some other gift to the table, I think we all have a chance to learn from each other how to show up better and, and to make this thing more healthy where we all have a better chance of flourishing. Beautiful. <clears throat> okay. Uh, really quickly, let's, and we're going to do maybe three or four more. Let's do meaning and purpose. Yeah. Because it's all myth, there isn't any real meaning other than the meaning that we make. And I think, uh, Margie, you said earlier that, um, that we have to have some sort of purpose. I think we have to, and, and that everyone's stories are sacred. And I think we have to respect that every person is different. And we have to give them the space, not only to create their own sacred meaning and stories, but we have to stop thinking we know better than them what they should do with that. Like often judgment and shame is this idea that I wouldn't do things the way you would do it without really any clear understanding that that person isn't you. They really don't have the same values, desires, traits, gifts, genetics, history, experiences. And you ought to respect their sacred story as unique and that they have more ability to uh, interact with their sacred story than your ability to interact with their sacred story and tell it for them. Um, I think there isn't any overlapping meaning that we should impose on anyone. I think everybody should be allowed to make meaning in their life. Now, the fear in this is that if you deconstruct everything, you end up at nihilism and you end up essentially hopeless. Um, I haven't experienced that. I somehow skipped it entirely. And the, the solution to nihilism at the very end is a thing called absurdism, where you recognize this is all crazy. Like 13 point something billion years ago happened and here you are. And it is miraculous. If your dad had stumbled at work and been one second later to getting home, then when him and your mom were intimate that night, you wouldn't be here. It'd be something else. And to recognize like it is miraculous still. It's still a miracle. And that everything about this world is just chaos and absurdity. Um, but it's also organized, right? Like evolution preferences organisms as they reach for nourishment and safety. And it punishes you when you are, don't have the ability to do that and instead put yourself in danger or starvation. And hence, evolution does have a flow chart that ends with more complexity, more progress, more development. So it's chaos, but it's organized chaos. And hence, let everybody make their own meaning and, have, and, and we also need to have safeguards in place and education in place that help to protect folks who seem to be drawn towards nihilism. Yeah, because, you know, for me and for Margie and I think many people I know, this is not a hard one to, to sort of um, absorb. This idea of, wow, yeah, you, life is great. You, you create the meaning, right? Um, and you can even create it consciously knowing mm -hmm. that you're creating it. But still, that's just what you value and what you choose to focus on. There's a group of people that are like, no, like, I want some external authority to tell me what my purpose is. I want a God. I want to believe that there's a supreme being who loves me, who's like got this chaos figured out, who's going to intervene to help me. And who am I to decide what my meaning and purpose is? I would much rather have someone tell me. And by the way, 
that sometimes people, you know, with ayahuasca, it's like, or, or psychedelics, it's like, oh, the plant is telling me what my, you know, but, yeah. but anyway, I they don't want to get back into that. They just make another myth that they take literally. But, but like, yeah, I'm just saying there are some, I just want to acknowledge there's some people who want to be told who they are and what their purpose is and what their meaning is. And it's not comforting for them to be told they get to construct their meaning. Yeah. They want a savior who died for them, who resurrected for them, who loves them unconditionally. And they want to be told this is what happens when you die. And this is where you go. And this is what you have to do to get there. And short of that, they're feeling afraid and, and hopeless. They have a right to their sacred story too. I don't want to take that away from them. For the folks who are deconstructing and see reality different than them, I simply want to talk about the tools that were helpful. Everyone has a right to their sacred story. So if somebody wants to believe in Mormonism or Jehovah's Witnesses or Scientology, I'm going to be one to say like, hey, for those willing to think about it, is it possible there's some unhealthy things there that maybe you're more, maybe it's more beneficial for you to think about? But I don't need those things to necessarily vanish. People who want those things are going to find them and stay in them. They're not going to deconstruct anyway. And then what would you say to somebody that's saying, Bill Real, you're, you're, you're the dude that runs around telling people that Santa Claus doesn't exist. Your whole Mormonism live, your whole uh, Mormon discussion, mm -hmm. that's all you do is, is, is steal and rob people of their myth, of their sacred myth. I'll, I'll levy to you a criticism I once received. You're a spiritual Jack Kevorkian. You are killing people's sacred beliefs yeah. and stories and myths because you're proactively generating content that tears down faith. I'm also the guy who co-hosts the Almost Awakened podcast that seeks to give people tools to reconstruct things in a healthy way and define spirituality post-religion. Um, I'm also the guy who uh, seems to notice that everyone that comes out of Mormonism uh, that credits me for being a part of their journey thanks me up and down for helping them to find a better, healthier life. And again, for the folks who don't want to deconstruct, their brain is going to find a way to not deconstruct. That's the human journey. Confirmation bias, backfire effect, uh, belief persistence, those are real. As you guys pointed out yesterday, Jonathan Haidt, emotion is really what drives us. People will figure out what their needs are, and they will move towards those. Okay. Yeah, was, so, oh, yeah. please. Oh, I was going to say one really quick thing about nihilism, and I, I kind of talked about this a little bit in my Thrive story, um, that for me, I, I'm not sure, I don't, I'm not talking about nihilism as a place to like nest, pitch a tent and live. But like nihilism was an important part of my story. It It's not something I chose. It's just how, for me, the towers of things, of reality and, and how I perceived that reality and what I felt like was true, how the timing of how many went down at the same time that I had a, a, a moment of nihilism that was really um, kind of important to my journey too, um, ironically, that having that space and that darkness um, and being kind of by myself without all the voices telling me who to be or uh, what they expected of me or trying to make sure I was okay and to fix it and b rebuild it too soon, that that was a really important part of my rebuilding was to be in the dark for a while and to actually look around me and say, wow, there's a, there's a significant amount of wreckage and I'm, I'm just going to sit in it for a while. Yeah. The only thing I would add to that is I think Britt Hartley feels the same way. I've had conversations with her and she had a nihilistic stage. At some point in this conversation, we're going to talk about the idea of life ending and the ending of life. And what I mean by that is that we're all going to die 
and we have this process in this country, and it varies from state to state, but the ability to intentionally end life. And I have thoughts around that. But in the nihilistic stage, my worry is that folks will become so hopeless, and some do, that they take their life when there really was, at least if they would have given it a moment, there was light at the end of the tunnel, like you, like Britt Hartley, you come around and you go, oh, let me, that's also another thing that I'm deconstructing. And I come up with a new way to make meaning. And I would, I would want to push for us to educate and have tools that I don't have a problem with someone spending time in a nihilistic stage. My worry is that some will be so hopeless that at least some do end up taking their life. Yes, I so see that. That's completely valid. And my nihilism, I always talk about it like the, and we can move after this, but like a cocoon. For me, I experienced it like a cocoon, meaning it was a process. It was part of caterpillars in cocoons, mm -hmm. literally digest themselves. Their old form disappears. And that's when in turn they become a butterfly. But if you poke a hole, if you interrupt that process, they don't get to the butterfly. So I like that idea of it's, it's being part of a process of something that changes form or, you know, creates something different on the other end. Yeah. Um, so I think that's really valid. Yeah. And important to say. Yeah, I love that. Me too. Okay. Uh, I think I want to end with death. Um, the resolutions about mm -hmm. death. So mm -hmm. I want you to know that's coming. Please. Let's do morality next. And specifically, I think when, when Mormons think about morality, they think of sexuality and like do's and don'ts around sexuality. Of course, morality can be anything from how to treat people to how much harm do you do to how to treat one another. Yeah. Um, I think Mormons also think, I think they think of two things, sexuality and word of wisdom, like drugs and alcohol. Um, and so, and so what, what sometimes I see is that, and I'll just set this up because I'm really curious mm -hmm. about your thoughts on this. And Amanda, you have my thoughts and feelings about this too. Um, that, you know, if, if you were an Orthodox Mormon who, who did their best to obey the law of chastity and the word of wisdom, there's a decent chance you made it to marriage, never having a sexual partner and having never tried, you know, drugs or alcohol, or if you had maybe only minimally, right? And so there's all sorts of these, um, you know, post-Mormons that didn't have their rumspringer, they didn't have their, their f college fraternity or sorority experience. They've probably only had one sexual partner their whole lives. But more importantly, they felt incredibly controlled and oppressed and suppressed when it comes to sex, drugs, and rock and roll. So then they lose their faith. They're angry and resentful at all the time and money that they sacrificed to something that they now believe turned out to be a lie. And they're often in their middle age, which is when take religion completely out of it. You're like, is this all that life's about? Do I really want to be married to this person? Like life's not exciting for me. I'm in a dead end job. My kids, have, you know, it hasn't, you know, whatever. Mm -hmm. And so they're seeking, it's a very vulnerable time, midlife crisis, frankly, I think. Mm -hmm. um, so what so many do is they're like, I've had these chains on me forever. I've been lied to. I feel like I missed out on all these amazing opportunities. Mm -hmm. And so it's like, how do I experiment with sexuality? You know, maybe it's non-monogamy. Maybe it's affairs. Maybe it's whatever. There's that angle that then I've seen sometimes lead to blowing up relationships that otherwise might have been really healthy, or sometimes it's blowing up relationships that never should have been forged to begin with. But you do see a lot of carnage sometimes. Now, you, I'm not saying that that's all you see, but you can see that. You can see people blow up their lives that way. And then, of course, drugs and alcohol... I have seen people become addicted. I've seen people just become a, a sloshy shadow of their intellectual selves because they think I'm, I'm in control. I'm my own authority. These things aren't addictive. 
And then fast forward five or 10 years and you're like, wow, you're not the person that I used to know. You're, you're just, you have a new master, you know, and it's not necessarily a healthy master because addictions are real, you know? So religion says for better, for worse, here are the do's and don'ts. Here's how to stay out of trouble. And like part of why I've tried to avoid some experimentation is because I grew up seeing some of these things destroy lives in my formative years. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, okay, well, let's not throw out the good. Like maybe Mormonism had some good rules that we're all better to follow. So how do you create a moral center and not end up getting lost in all the chemicals that sexual and drug and alcohol and all sorts of explorations can afford that can also become fire that, that wrecks your life. Yeah, man, that's a, it's hmm. a big question. So let's start with morality generally. So the, the debate between religion and atheist on morality is that how does an atheist know that they're actually creating a coherent, healthy, good morality if on some level it is subjective. And the religionists come in and say, you know, once you posit that there is a God, that the rules that God gave are legitimate, hence, whether we think the rule is good or not, God is, you know, God's ways are not our ways, and hence we can just trust in them, and we can know that God's rules are good, even if our own inner self can't figure that out. And I, I just don't buy that, because... I can sit and look at the rules that God made, and even the most strident Christian among us would be picking and choosing which ones over time they've discarded, and which new rules aren't even in there, and then which rules are in there that we continue to obey. So God himself might be great at making rules, but because he's limited to giving his rules to another human being, and that human being writes them in stone the rules themselves end up being flawed. So then the question becomes that even if on some level an atheist creating a morality is subjective, can we put some trust in that? And again, if we go back to the evolutionary process where even the earliest life forms that were single cell organisms move towards nourishment and safety and away from danger and of trying to avoid starvation, we can sense that even the earliest life among us has values. And I can go onto YouTube and I can type in animal morality and I can watch uh, chimpanzees have reciprocity and fairness. So even without the narrative, even without the stories and without God entirely, other species of animals with lesser mental function than we have are figuring out that they have values, even without having a story that they have values. So when I look at religion... I recognize that when you have an outside voice, God, and God is giving his set of rules to a human being, and that human being places the rules on the tribe and says, those are his rules, don't argue with them, what ends up happening is that bad rules are allowed to be perpetuated generation after generation. They can't be criticized. They can't be questioned. Not only bad rules, though. Not good good, good rules, rules, too. too. Totally. But as people are different and moments in time are different, we need to have things have more of a softness where we can shift and adjust. Because there are moments in time where violence may be required. And there are moments in time where violence is the most horrific thing in the world. And the trouble is when you have rules and they're given by God and they're written in stone, literally, they're not adaptable or changeable. And so Sam Harris gives a TED talk where he says, we can sort of rely on science to tell us the best ways to treat each other. And science might be a better way to do it. Now, again, this is all complex because you're right. Religion gets things, some things right. It may be getting some things right that we judge as wrong. And if we change it, we got worse for it. But God is also isn't the arbiter of that because we can see bad positions that take hundreds of years longer to denounce and get rid of, Right. So for me, morality has to center around 
values that we collectively agree on have held solid throughout time without any religious peer pressure, shame, or fear in having that conversation. And it seems to be the things that the animals have already picked up on on some level. Reciprocity, fairness, reducing suffering in the world, compassion. Um, we ought to create rules around those things, right? And the atheist is probably getting some things wrong. The religionist certainly has gotten some things wrong. But I think when you put the rules insulated into an echo chamber where they can't be criticized, that is way worse than having an open forum where we can discuss whether in real time those rules are ending with positive benefits or not. Mm -hmm. But both systems are flawed. Okay? So there's morality generally. The argument that the atheist can't have a solid morality, we already know that that's nonsense. The problem comes in is that the religionist still wants to say, even if you think you're making good rules, how do you know? And we can know because we can test, at least to some degree, whether the rules have net benefits or are causing uh, unforeseen harm. And we may have to live out this experiment trying to figure that out. Now, in terms of sexuality, I was telling you guys last night, one of the videos on the soft white underbelly is this person who has a deep sexual compulsion to have sex with everyone everywhere. And as a society or as an individual, we look at folks like that and we go, ooh, I don't know. That's a rough life to live out. I don't know. That might, we might want to shame that person and judge that person and, and talk about it in such a way that anyone who approaches that sort of paradigm, that, they, that we uh, shame them into avoiding it. And or this, incarcerate them or kick them out of the group, yeah. right? Yeah. Excommunicate them from the group yeah. so that they're shunned and isolated yeah. and out of our sight. Yeah. But the other side of it is, uh, so there are, Again, because human, there is no right way to be human. And the only overlaying code for me is to not allow intentional harm or unnecessary trauma. That there are folks in this world who are asexual. We had a great friend back in uh, Ohio who was asexual. Uh, she had zero interest at all in being intimate with other people on a sexual, on a sexual part of their life. And we all on the woke side of things, on the deconstructed side of things, we all look at someone who's asexual and we go, yeah, no biggie. That's cool. Like, I don't need you to be something other than you are. Wouldn't we expect to find on the other side of the spectrum, somebody who is highly sexual? Like, isn't that also a normal expression of humanity? We have this conversation in, in the fields of science about what's normal or abnormal. And the way we think about it in a layman term isn't correct. Any behavior that shows up uh, consistently, no matter how small, is a normal human behavior. And I don't mean normal as we should allow it, it's good, it's healthy, because we, we recognize that certain, um, let me say it this way, human beings should have the right to be their fullest authentic self, but there are higher priorities than that, such as consent and reducing harm. So while we want to let all human beings be as much of themselves as they can be, we also have boundaries and should have boundaries in our society that don't let people be who they want to be at the expense of hurting someone else unnecessarily. So we have rules like consent and enthusiastic consent. And so in humanity, if somebody has a high sexual drive and they reach out to another human being and they say, I would like to do this with you. Their extent, and as long as they are honest and open about their sexual health, um, there, there really isn't anything going wrong there. We're judging it. We're applying shame and judgment. But if two consensual adults agree to do something that doesn't cause harm on anyone else, it's no one else's business. Um, and within a marriage, for instance, there's no way... You can get two human beings who are going to mesh in those facets of their life perfectly. And there are certain issues that really are abrasive in a relationship. One issue is one partner doesn't want to have children and the other does. And the other trouble with Mormonism is it, it imposes and pressures young people 
who don't really know who they are yet, and they sure as hell don't know who their partner is yet. And how could they? Pressures them into making very quick decisions with very little experience. So the science says that for you to find a partner that you can share a life with and be compatible enough that it will be a life of uh, a, a good chance of contentment and well-being and happiness for the two of you, that you need to experience somewhere between 14 and 17 relationships before that to really understand who you are and what you're looking for in someone else. But in Mormonism, you you marry the first person that you had, you seriously date. You go to BYU, you date them, you marry them, and maybe it works. But probably more likely is that there are significant differences that you don't even figure out until you're 10 years down the road. And hence, why wouldn't the divorce rate in this country, or anywhere else for that matter, be somewhere around the range of 50%? Because you're, you're, you're just not even aware of who you are until you experience some more of life. And so rather than encourage people to marry young, maybe we ought to encourage people to experience life for a minute and then to marry once they better understand each other. There's a quote here too. Let's see if I can grab it here really quick. And, and I love this quote because relationships are about compromise and negotiation. And that's also a very complex matter in that almost never is a win-win. Somebody is fighting to show up as more of themselves, and the other person is uh, trying to push back because they want to feel safe. And so here's the quote. Within ethical and legal constraints, we all have the right to push for what we want from our partner and to suffer the consequences for pushing too hard. Similarly, we also have the right to deny our partner's request and to suffer the consequences for shutting them down. But we need to remember that nothing in a relationship happens in a vacuum. It is influenced by what comes before as well as what else is going on in the relationship. So generosity can be rewarded and bad behavior can be punished in more ways than one. Therefore, we have to keep the bigger picture in mind. What price am I willing to pay for this, if it's worth it, then it's worth it. But since life and relationships involve compromise and sacrifice, we have to consider the potential ripple effects. And what I read from that is it's sort of a really, it's a really difficult thing to negotiate a relationship in such a way that both sides feel safe and both sides get to be as much of their authentic self as they need to be so that they feel well-being and contentment. And, and trying to find a perfect way to lay all that out, especially if you're going to design the rules so that we all have to agree that we all have to do it the same way, is ridiculous. And again, because people's sacred stories are personal and we ought to trust them to know their sacred stories better than us, we ought to let each individual and each relationship determine what that looks like without us putting our own expectations on it because we do it a certain way. So some people in this world lean very much towards monogamy. They really only want to have the security of one person. They don't need to experience intimacy anywhere else. And other people are very different than that. And we should expect that to be the case. And hence, we ought to let every person or partnership within ethical within an ethical boundary again we should have boundaries about how we treat each other in ways that hurts others unnecessarily so consent's a big deal religionists want to make a slippery slope argument well bill if you're going to let people be gay if you're going to let people uh, have open marriages well before long it's not going to be long before we allow people to have sex with animals and children and that's just absurd. It's ridiculous. It's a fallacy. Because we all recognize we're going to collectively build a society on consent. And you already see the world moving that way. When I grew up, nobody taught me consent. And then somewhere along the way, they taught consent. And then somewhere along the way, they taught enthusiastic consent because consent alone isn't sufficient. People aren't... people. When there's power differences, when people have uh, fears and feel shame or judgment, they tend to not exactly show their excitement about doing something, and hence they'll do the thing that looks like they're consenting, but they're really not. 
And so we're already seeing the society move that way. We ought to trust people to figure these things out, but we also ought to give people much better support, education, and frameworks so that they can do that in a healthy way. Because really what stops us from doing it healthy is that there's so much shame and judgment often created by religious systems that we all go like, oh, I have to figure this out in secret. I can't actually talk out loud and figure out how to do this in a healthy way. I got to sort of just figure it out without telling anybody. Because if I tell somebody, "Uh uh-oh, what happens? And so we, the religions want to point at how this always shows up unhealthy, but maybe it's the constraints and the judgment and the shame that they put on everyone that actually leaves us unable to do this in a healthy way. Beautiful. Thank you. Um, super thoughtful. Amanda, I'm, I'd love to hear if you have any other additional things to add. Yeah, I'll try to be quick because I do want to get into death and your mom, um, but to try to go along with some of your thoughts and questions that you were asking about morality. Um, so for me, a, a big part of my personal growth and my journey in all of this is, is changing my thought processes from having good and bad to different. So religion, you know, puts on as things are good and things are bad. But again, that's arbitrary. And that was somebody's opinion of how they wanted that thing to work, right? And so as, as I, I, I'm switched from that and still working very hard on a lot of those, but going different opened up a world of empathy for me as well. And then um, jokingly, we have, we have one rule, don't be a dick. Also knowing that sometimes everybody's a dick, right? But if we, if we hold fast to like, don't be a dick, try to relieve suffering and, and things like that. Um, what people do, it's none of your business. Like, like we're all saying here, as long as we're consensual adults, um, it's nobody else's business. And as far as the, the addiction and the drugs and things, you know, like Bill, when, when he started his podcast, was trying to get people just to slow down. That's what I would say as you're deconstructing, slow down. You know, if you look at teenagers going through a normal life, they don't do all of these things in one night. They take years to experience themselves, right? Well, now that you're an adult and you've deconstructed, you don't have to hit the ground running. Slow down. Take your time. Do research. And this is where secular Buddhism comes in. If you're able to sit with your feelings, you don't need to rush to address them quickly. You don't have to resolve the uh, tension that's going on between what you want to be or how you want your world to look and the fact that it isn't and doesn't. You can sit still for a minute and process things, take your time, do the research, think about things from multiple angles, and make calculated, methodical decisions about how you want to shift and change your life so as to be, again, to be kind to everyone else around you, to respect everyone else's need to feel safe in your space, and for you to show up as much human as you can, again, without causing intentional harm or unnecessary trauma. I was just going to say really quick, one thing that I do feel like is quite unique and I just have, I want to like openly acknowledge as being a challenge within Mormonism, people leaving Mormonism in the middle of their lives is just that it's almost like we were handed a tower. They like religion helped us build this tower of morality. And then as we transition, it kind of crumbles, but how difficult it can be to rebuild morality while you are actively living the choices of a conditioned self. So you're married to someone, you know, uh, under and the, the qualities and the things that you looked for in that person were, you know, they represent your conditioned self. So and, and some of those values were like monogamy is supreme and monogamy is all and you selected someone and kind of and I, I do feel like or you are a mom when you, you know, kind of are transitioning away from Mormonism. And maybe part of your reconstructing is, re- is really coming to this conclusion that maybe you wouldn't have had four kids. But guess what? You woke up and you have four kids, you know? And so how tough it is to, to kind of do this, do this work of, and privilege 
of connecting with ourselves. And I do think there's identity work here in non-monogamy. I do see that as part of oftentimes much like attraction or much like other things that, you know, that it can emerge during this time. But to do it in real time while living a reality of a life that a conditioned past self created, I think it's really, really tough. And people deserve just all the softness Mm -hmm. as they're, you know, negotiating and rebuilding. Hmm. Hmm. Mm -hmm. The only thing I would add to that, because any uh, expression of sexuality, anything from asexual to monogamy to being something other than monogamy, ethical non-monogamy in all of its thousand forms, those are all valid expressions of humanity. So no, nowhere would I say any one of those, including monogamy or asexuality, is wrong. What I would say, though, is that the societal or tribalism mechanism of imposing monogamy uh, or polygamy, by the way, monogamy, two different reasons, but monogamy as a overarching structure by which this is the rule we all have to play by, recognize why that myth was created. That myth created... Uh, mechanisms by which trust would be less likely to be broken from members of the tribe to each other, and on a lesser extent, uh, perhaps risking the health of the tribe when you talk about sexually transmitted uh, diseases, for instance. And so it makes perfect sense that religion would come along and for the far majority say monogamy is the status quo, it's the rule, we all need to follow it, because it contributed to the trust that we would all have with each other. Mm-hmm. And notice, by the way, patriarchy and objectifying women also as part of that. Mm -hmm. She's my object. She's not your object. She's not your object. I own her. Hence, you can't bother her. She's mine. It it ensures that we all, again, trust each other and don't don't start getting into the gray areas of bumping into each other's boundaries. Polygamy, on the other hand, from a religious perspective, seems to be about privilege and patriarchy. Not that there's something wrong with polygamy. If consenting adults agree to do it, great. But when religious coercion comes on comes along and says God said to do it, notice the, who that benefits and who that hurts. Mm-hmm. I love your emphasis on harm. Yeah. You know. I think By the way, a, when you really... ask for what, how I'm different than I was, it's that I'm constantly self-aware of harm that I'm doing and others are doing. Yep. All right. All right. So the next big one uh, is community. Yeah. Um, I think they, they, you know, oftentimes religious people will like to say religion is associated with greater happiness. And statistically, there is a correlation there. I think it's a weak correlation, but it, there's a correlation, meaning that on average, there's a statistically uh, people who attend an organized religion have a small statistical advantage in terms of happiness than people who don't. And that's mm-hmm. all self-reported data, I think. Mm-hmm. But when social scientists tease out the active ingredient in a uh, re- you know, religion-based happiness, it's community. So uh, one of the biggest things I notice when people leave Mormonism or organized religion is loneliness. They, lo- they immediately lose all their friends, m- many of their family, and then their ward community. And then they're faced with trying to figure out how to piece that together. Now, over the past 20 years, with the internet, we've made, in social media, we've made major strides in trying to help people find friends, find community, whether it's through workshops, retreats, Facebook groups, ex- ex-Mormon Reddit, Thrive, whatever, you know. Um, but there still is this massive hole of ex-Mormons feeling lonely, can't find a good friend, missing the community associations that they had, and in many instances, longing for a community to do life with. Because you could talk about spirituality in isolation, morality in isolation, um, uh, all sorts of things in isolation, if you can find a group of people 
to positively reinforce, to teach and to positively reinforce spirituality, morality, meaning, purpose, child rearing, it takes a village, all that. I mean, isn't that why we we thrived in tribes? Isn't that why religions developed? Because, because community helps with all these other holes that we're talking about. So, um, have you cracked that nut? And uh, I know the answer is no, but I'm going to ask it anyway. <laughs> yeah. So first, we got to go back into the things you started with. This idea that there's a slight advantage to folks feeling happy inside the religion. I want to question that a minute. In a system that tells everyone that every member is a missionary, that the church is the best thing for your neighbor to convert to, that, it, that we need to protect the good name of the church, all the mechanisms that exist that tell a believing Mormon they need to present Mormonism in its best light, might there be a propensity to report a higher level of happiness than there actually is? And my hunch is that yes. Because there's so much motivation for you to show your community that things are working out really good over here in Mormonism, that you tend to report being better than maybe you actually are. So I'm going to question that for a moment as a premise. Okay. Um, second is that in a system that denigrates the people that leave that tells you to distance yourself in relationship from those who are apostate, that calls them names such as lazy learner or the chafe among the wheat or the tares or looking for sin. Might religion be creating the monster and then pointing at the monster and saying, look what happens when you leave. You're not happy. You're lonely. You lose all your relationships. When it was actually the religion by its own theology that created the distance between you and your loved ones to begin with. So if we account for those, now the difference might be either less significant or insignificant, right? Well, I'm going to, honestly, if in the spirit of dialogue, I'm going to, I'm going to, let, let me respond. So can we go to the complete opposite end and agree what, what we're finding now, especially post COVID which is that loneliness is more deadly Amen. than than cigarettes mm -hmm. and, and drugs. Mm -hmm. So like loneliness is is horrible. Yeah. Do you agree? Yeah, totally. Absolutely. Okay. okay. So then if you don't have loneliness, then how do you have community? How do you find friends? Yeah. Right? Yeah. And what you're just you could I could I could match you in listing all the harms about, you know groups, groupthink and or religion from patriarchy to judgment, to superiority, to, um, you know, the protection of the group over the individual to abuse, to protection of abusers, like, uh, we could, you know, to rules that benefit the group and harm the individual. I could list a million things, but the truth is there are certain rules for group thriving. And guess what? Having an enemy turns out to be one of the rules of group thriving. So what you're listing as a bug is actually a feature if you start with the premise we just agreed to, which mm -hmm. is that loneliness is deadly. Mm -hmm. So yeah, yeah, it sucks that groups usually have to finger an enemy. And when I mean finger, I mean point to identify an enemy. But guess what? That makes a stronger group. And having a myth mm -hmm. that may be superstitious, I mean, watch the village, right? Mm -hmm. Like, okay, a bunch of people got together and made some shit up and knew that it wasn't true and taught it, but, sorry for the spoiler, but guess what? That was the order and the myth that the group needed to organize around. And so you either, you either don't have a myth, which means you have a weaker community, or you all figure out a way to delude yourself into a, believing a myth, which is hard, Maybe that was Joseph Smith's stroke of brilliance, or maybe there's a there's a group of elites that knowingly perpetuate a myth, but in their minds it's for the benefit of the group. Mm -hmm. Regardless, like what you're mentioning as bugs might be features, because these are the types of things groups need 
to thrive and survive. Another one I'm going to say is guilt and shame. We all, Brene Brown, 2020, whatever, shame, shame, shame is the worst thing, right? Well, well, turns out, how do you get people to show up and set up chairs? I've tried in a secular community. Some will, but usually it only lasts a few weeks or a few months and then they're gone. It's like, show up at some Sunday meeting and hear some person, blah, 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 or brunch and watch Netflix. Over time, almost everyone chooses brunch and Netflix community dies. At least that's been my experience with Thrive and with other things. It's not that Thrive is dead. It's not that Oasis is dead. It's not the community of good or all the different secular communities we've tried to build. It's not that they're dead, but that it's been really hard to create a critical mass of a sustainable community. And turns out guilt and shame are along with enemies and a in a fictitious myth, they're all super valuable to yeah. create a community. If you don't have them, guess what? In many instances, you don't have community. So again, start with the premise that loneliness is deadly. Mm -hmm. Name all the bugs you want. They're probably, they're probably features, not bugs. And so what are you going to do to create this community? Again, you have a podcast that's like someone would say is destroying people's faith, which is destroying their allegiance to their community, which is destroying community, which is leading to loneliness and sadness and despair and death. But you don't have a, a you don't have a, a, a way to build a healthy community that's yeah, sustainable. Totally. So Okay, that's my response. Yeah. So now that we've laid all that complexity, I would only know all I was trying to say in the beginning was that once someone's deconstructed and they're now out of the system and they're experiencing loneliness, at least in part, it's because the system itself has a theology that tells all of the people who are still in to stay away from the people who got out. The, the connection, and anytime we other someone, we are hurting human connection. Because now they're different than us, they're other, they're, we're good, they're bad, we're in, they're out. Anytime we apply those labels, we are causing a fracture and distance in human connection. So with all that said, and with all the complexity you added, this topic is probably out of all these things that are part of this formula of, of thriving and flourishing, this one is probably the one I have the least amount of answers for. And as you pointed out, you already knew my answer would be, I don't quite know how to get to it. I'm lucky in part, I'm privileged in that forming deep, authentic, vulnerable friendships are so difficult to even initiate. So for instance, we came from Ohio. Our faith was falling apart there. Had we left the church there and had our friends done what the church taught them and they separated from us, which for the most part, for most of them, would have been inevitable. What would me and Amanda have done? Would we have gone to the bar and essentially, whether we wanted to drink or not, we would have had to have hit that scene and started just walking up to complete strangers and entering conversations and then hoping that our lifelong religious experience would have some sort of overlap with some other strangers that we could begin to sense that our lives might have enough meshing to form really deep friendships. And my hunch is that would have been an absolute nightmare and struggle. I'm lucky that we moved to Southern Utah where there are tons of post-Mormons. And so rather than bonding over our beliefs, we bonded over our deconstructed beliefs, right? And by the way, trauma bonding is such a beautiful and problematic initiation into deep friendship, but on some level, it absolutely works. And so getting together with people who all have this similar journey was really helpful to forming tons of friendships, what I would call really good friendships, people that every time I see them, I am grateful and I, I want to hug them and I want to sit next to them and catch up and I want to know what's going on in their lives and what are they thinking about and what are they reading and, and what's challenging them and what's going well. All that said, we also run into another problem going back to Sapiens, which is you only can really have a deep, dynamic vulnerable, authentic friendship with a small number of people. If you get that group into too big of a size, if you want to be everyone's friend, 
you end up having no deep, meaningful friendship at all. Mm -hmm. So you have to find a way to find two other people, five other people, maybe eight other people. But there comes a point where you hit 10 or 12, 14, where you now are too big for you to really be able to spread your time enough that all of those other people perceive you as giving them the investment that they hence feel the value in returning it. So how do you build a community? And I think you've said this as well as anyone, which is you've used the word pods, but you have to find, and by the way, again, if you're not in an area heavily saturated with post-Mormons, you're going to have exponentially more difficulty, I think, doing this. So I speak from a place of privilege. You speak from a place of privilege where you might feel like you at least have access to enough good people with enough life experience overlap that a connection can be made and a deep friendship can be initiated. But if you find two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight more people who will let you be your authentic self. And again, never perfect. You can't exactly be you anywhere. You can't even exactly be you inside your own head sometimes. Find a small number of people that you can be as much of your authentic self as feels safe and secure and gives you contentment. And then you have to invest in those people. You have to, you have to give them their time, your time. You have, if they have a thing happen in their life, you have to care. You have to show up. You have to serve. You have to help. Religion shames you into doing that. It tells you you have to, we have to make assignments and drop off casseroles. So there's real work involved. And this may be one of the harder facets to replicate outside the church in such a way that you feel like you're getting the human connection you need versus being in the system, even if the friendships were superficial, because the moment you showed up as your real humanity, you were othered. So the, so the relationship wasn't exactly real. But the benefit of even the superficial relationship can often feel real and meet that social need because you're a social creature. And hence, how you find those people if you're, if you're quirky, how do you find those people if you're extremely different? How do you find those people if you're out in the Midwest and you're not near post-Mormons at all? There are so many barriers and so many folks, as you point out, have deep emotional hurt and pain over not being able to do it. And I don't have the perfect answer. And, and what works for me, and it, and it isn't exactly working, what works for me, it only works for me because I'm privileged in a place and in a situation that I couldn't recommend it as a formula because it, 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 it wouldn't be almost anyone else's circumstance. And I don't want to frame all this in language of fear and negativity. We found some amazing friends. We found amazing community. And we know a lot of people who have. I do want to say, and when you add to this acknowledged difficulty of community creation and maintenance, the sex and drugs problem that we just talked about previously, you that that can make it a lot more complicated. When people are dealing with the trauma of having left a high demand religion and they're newly experimenting with, and they're angry and they're newly experimenting with lots of sex and lots of drugs and they're trying to form a community, that can be even more complicated yeah. and and fraught with problems. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And, I, and risk. Yeah. To your personal health, to abuse, and to your relationships that you value. Yeah. The, the only thing, again, I, I speak from a place of privilege. It's not even fair for me to say. And I will add that I've been in settings with 50 people who constantly revisit each other in their lives. Like there is this coherent friendship that maybe for some isn't as deep as they would like, but they're, they have a group of people that they know well enough and are constantly bumping into and enjoying that interaction. And 
in the midst of these 50 people revisiting each other, say at a party, they're all showing up as their various brands of humanity and everyone seems to be really okay with letting the group be different from each other in that shared space. So I think it's attainable, but the privilege of having those kinds of people with overlap of experience around you and you almost get a free introduction to get to know them on the front end is, isn't always available in any other situation. Yeah. Yeah. I, I sometimes have thought having tried to create community, secular community now for 20 years, like, it seems so hard without guilt, shame, manipulation, superiority, enemies, dogma. It seems almost impossible. I almost think of it like E equals MC square or like evolution. Pick, pick your thing that was like transformed humanity, germ theory. The person that can figure out healthy, sec healthy secular community, healthy community, healthy, sustainable community without religion that's going to be like a sea change in humanity if it ever happens at all. It's like electricity, like evolution, germ theory, and freaking healthy, sustainable, secular community. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. You know what I mean? Writing, the printing press. And, and in some sense, Bill, we were talking about this. Like, what if humanity depends on it? What if we're effing with you, me, Radio Free Mormon, Lindsay at some park, anyone who steps up into the, you know, criticizing religion or high demand religion space or helping, you know, facilitating deconstruction. What if we're literally pulling at the seams of humanity and actually doing harm to our species? Yeah. Because as awful as some may think organized religion is, guess what? It can get worse. Try anarchy, try Bosnia Herzegovina, you know. Try post Saddam Hussein Iraq. Take your pick. There is something worse than tyranny, and that's anarchy. At least with tyranny, you know, you you kind of know the rules of what's going to get you into trouble. When there's no rules and everybody's doing whatever they want, you've just got snipers that are taking you out, and you don't even know why or have no police you can call. Right? So, like, what if we're doing harm to humanity by what we do as podcasters and yeah. as YouTubers? Yeah. I mean, it sounds extreme and alarmist, but it, it's possible. As you point out, these are the things that we've been thinking about for years. Um, I don't know a better way than to value individual well-being over systemic perpetuation that includes harm. And we, what you just named might be true, but I don't have any choice but to push ahead and see. Margie's nodding. Wow. Why are you nodding, Margie? Because I, I feel that. You agree? You feel the same that Bill does? Yeah. Yeah. Do you want to expand or? Nope, that's all. <laughs> yeah, I do too, because like the idea of perpetuating lies, like you think about the movie The Village, the idea of knowingly and consciously perpetuating lies or superstitions or falsehoods, mm -hmm. that seems untenable. It's like if that's what's required for humanity to thrive, then maybe humanity doesn't deserve to continue. Yeah. Or if it's like, you know, you meet these people where it's like, man, if I had a gay kid, I'd leave my church too. But because I don't, I'm staying in it. Isn't like this idea of, of like too? knowingly, knowing indifference to large, non, non significant, non insignificant, knowing indifference to the harm of non, -insign non insignificant groups of people. And just like, yeah. But that trans thing isn't my problem. That gay thing isn't my problem. That feminism thing isn't my problem. That racial thing, 
the police stuff, that's not my problem. And just like going with a community that's like you and that feels familiar, if that's what you have to do to be a Mormon or to be in a high demand religion, F that, F that shiz. <laughs> so like, but that is Mormonism. The people that stay in Mormonism, a big chunk of them are bound by suspicion or indifferent to the suffering of large groups of people. Or they d feel like they're trying to change it from within, but that's, that's misery. Mm -hmm. Staying in a toxic organization indefinitely to try and change it when, when it kills the people, it's change agents, when it's known to kill its change agents. How toxic is that? Amen. So like, I'm with you. We, we only can press forward, but like it may be to, it, hopefully it won't be to our collective demise, but it could be. Yeah. <laughs> it could the, be. Yeah. The thing I would add on top of that is we do have a little bit of perspective. Finland was just voted the a uh, country with the best individual well-being, like the, the citizens reported being the happiest, safest, securest, uh, life life opportunities, health care, uh, chances to, to be themselves, six years in a row. Now, who is second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth? It's those same countries right mm -hmm. around it. Norway, Denmark, Switzerland. What's Denmark. 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 Yes. What is unique about those that block? One is, if I'm not mistaken, they're on, on the modern moment, they are much more atheistic. More which, secular, yeah. Mm -hmm. Which seems to indicate that a deconstruction of religion does have a uh, trajectory of ending with more happiness and self-contentment. Uh, and the society seems to function great. Also, if we go into their history, if I'm not mistaken, we're tied into sort of like the Northmen and the Vikings. It's sort of a different history. The, that block of countries comes from a different past than everyone else. And it might be worthwhile to dive into both how those countries in the modern moment operate. What is it that makes those countries unique? Because if it was just Finland... And the other ones were somewhere in the middle or lower, then you would sense like, oh, it's just a coincidence or maybe Finland's unique. But it is the very people who populated those uh, geographic locations who have some sort of historical evolutionary of some sort advantage that they are producing safe places where people are happy and content. Mm -hmm. The second thing is we might want to look at who those people are historically, and what kinds of beliefs, traditions, values, because we see the Vikings, for instance, as barbarians, but only because it's the religionists who are writing the story. And hence, if we dive into the history and examine who those people were, we might learn something about what made an environment where the countries that are one through six happiest countries on the planet why they're different than the rest of us. And stop assuming, by the way, America is the greatest. It's the best. That's not true. That's a myth. Patriotism is essential to beating the bad guys. But if you're going to start deconstructing, deconstructing the United States of America as the best country on earth, that's a good place to start. I know Margie loves uh, some of those Scandinavian countries. The I, I think we have things to learn from those countries. Mm -hmm. The only critique or pushback I have is they're super white. They don't have uh, multi-racial, multi-ethnic societies to deal with that are much more complex and difficult. They don't have the, necessarily the history of slavery or of oppression. Um, and And also my own personal critique is they've benefited from the protection of other countries. Mm -hmm. So like, yeah, if, if let's just say the UK and great in the United States and others hadn't intervened to keep Hitler from sweeping through Germany or Stalin from sweeping the other way, those countries, none of them would have stood totally. And they don't have the military budgets to defend themselves, but they rely totally. on treaties with countries like us to be able to maintain their status. So there's something about 
it's more complex. In some sense, they have a lot of white privilege and a lot of socioeconomic privilege, a lot of size privilege in the sense that they're smaller, that I don't think we, that fully accounts for their status. Yeah. We sort of intuitively grasp that there are certain democratic countries who would stay inside their own lines sort of forever, right? If Great Britain and America were left alone, for instance, you sort of intuitively perceive that neither one of them is going to go fight for more space. They might, in democratic ways, engage countries such as providences that have been adopted into the United States but aren't states yet, right? We sort of intuitively get that the countries that play by certain rules aren't fighting over boundaries anymore. They might be having influence and sending delegates and trying to change other countries' political systems, granted. But they're not trying to increase the size and scope of who they are. And so maybe on that angle, we ought to sense that what the world needs is that really, on some level, democracy does need to win. So that all countries are willing to stay in their own lines. And at that point, I think now you can start to have a conversation about how that block of countries works together with others to use that as a model for how all of us across the world have to get to a point if we're going to solve these problems of staying in our own lines and valuing each other and working together as a world society. Yeah. And just to leave this topic, the last thing I'll say is we tried super hard. Thrive has been an attempt to create secular community within the post-Mormon space. And it has been super sad, disconcerting to me to see the level to which people and mostly post-Mormons have risen up to destroy, to, to completely defame and, and try to destroy honest, sincere, genuine attempts to simply provide community for people. Yeah. Like we, there's something about that crab analogy where like a bunch of crabs are in a pot and one crab starts to get out and the other crabs pull it down. Even as post-Mormons, Sometimes we're so effing toxic yeah. at, and self-destructive. Yeah. And it's been super disheartening to see post-Mormons come out of the woodwork to try and destroy other people trying to do good and specifically people who try and create community by people that you would think would be fans of, of such attempts, but inexplicably they're, they're destructive forces. And yeah. Uh, you know, Thrive is still thriving in many ways, but it's been super sad for me to see. That adds just an extra layer of complexity yeah. that I just wanted to call out. I'm ready to move on. Yeah. <laughs> I, I would only say to that, I 100% agree with you. I don't really have anything to add, but we ought to, again, respect each other's differences and values. Almost every difference of opinion or conflict is based, is value oriented. And one value may not be worse than another. And if we understand other people's values, maybe we can understand why they do life differently than us. Yeah. Okay. So if you study psychology, especially psychology in the 50s and 60s and 70s, there's this idea of existential existentialism. There's a whole movement of psychology called ex existentialism. And it all revolves around how do we deal with death? Yeah. And as religion and sec as religion's on the decline and secularism's on the rise. That spotlights one of the biggest issues that we have as a species. It's like juxtaposing our self-awareness as conscious creatures with the realization that we and those around us who we love die. And that's one of the main value propositions of religion is that it, it presents itself as a solution to the mortality and the death problem. It says, hey, don't worry about it. Not only are we going to tell you who you are and give you spirituality and morality and meaning and purpose and community, we're going to tell you what happens when you die. And guess what? It's going to be great if you pay us a lot of money and do everything we say. Yeah. That's the rub, right? <laughs> and so they control death, but they plug that hole of death because you get all these Mormons that'll say, "I'm not, oh, my dad died? I'm fine. I'm going to see him in, you know, a few years. Or... Death's not bad. Death's a celebration. He's on to a better place. So, Bill and Amanda, if you want to add, let's end. Uh, and, you know, we've got 20 minutes. 
let's tackle death as yeah. the final topic that we talk about. What a better topic to tackle. And Bill, yeah. I, I have a sense you maybe have a story or two you want to tell as a preface to our discussion of death. Yeah. So before I left Ohio, my mom got skin cancer. She was, uh, she used tanning booths a lot in her early adulthood. And, uh, that literally came to bite her back in the ass because that's where she got her first, uh, a bra uh, a skin lesion of cancer was on her rear end. And she went and got it cut off and they thought they got all of it. They didn't. She, uh, it came back, it came back as brain cancer. Mm. She's 59 years old when she passed. Leading up to her death, she enters stage four. Doctors tell her that she's going to be lucky if she has months to live. She's still working. She just, she just always kept going. I would, I would try to have conversations with her where I checked in on her and you could just tell she didn't, she wanted to ignore all of it. She just wanted to keep pretending it wasn't there, still going to her doctor's appointments, doing the best she can to take care of it, but not wanting to outwardly, and I get it, who wants to be occupied with their time coming to an end when they can continue living? Because every moment, you, you never are dead. Like every, your consciousness is never aware of death. Any moment your consciousness is there, you're living. Um, she had issues with her memory. She went into the hospital at one point and we, I went, I flew into Ohio to visit. My dad was hysterical, falling apart. My mom couldn't identify me. She mistook me for my brother. She couldn't identify her grandchildren. She would look at the pictures and she sort of had an echo of like knowing she knew that person, but she couldn't name any of them. She didn't know what day it was. And we thought, oh my gosh, this is the way it's going to go down. This is horrific. And she got her wits back about her. My oldest kid was, uh, my oldest kid's wife was pregnant with my first grandchild, her first great grandchild. And she convinced my dad to let her fly by herself from Ohio to Vegas, get out of the airport, get herself to the rental car place nearby, get a vehicle, go to the casino slash hotel to stay at, leave the next morning and come to Southern Utah, two hour drive and see, see her first great grandchild as she's getting ready to die. And it was a horrific experience. The next day we're at the hospital. My daughter-in-law had just given birth. And now this is two days later and it's the day to go home. And my mom is supposed to show up at one o'clock and she doesn't. So we start panicking. I call my dad and my brother back in Ohio and I say, what's going on here? Mom's not here yet. We try to call her. She's not answering her phone. My dad convinces the hotel to do a wellness check. They go to her room. She's not there, but all of her bags are. She was supposed to be checked out at 11 o'clock. They don't have the hotel reserved for the, the day. My Mom isn't answering her phone. She's sort of being, she is like texting once in a while. My dad can see that she's taking money out of the ATM machine every so often. She loves to play the, she loved to play the slot machines. She, what ends up happening, my dad can trace the chain of events by seeing when things happen, such as when she checked into the hotel, when did she pick up the rental car? She gets into the airport, plane lands on time. It takes like four hours for her to get from the airport to the rental car company, which makes no sense at all. It takes another two hours when it should have taken 15 minutes for her to get from the rental car company to the hotel. My mom in some state of mind, unable to function fully is in loops, getting stuck and taking way longer to accomplish things that should have taken short amount of time. The, the next, uh, the next step for me is I don't know what to do. The best thing I can do is figure out how to get somebody as I get in a van with my wife and start heading to Vegas to find my mom, who I don't even know really where to start other than the hotel she's supposed to be at. I call ahead to friends who are already in Vegas that live there. And I say, hey, I've got an emergency. My mom is somewhere in Las Vegas and I don't know where she's at. So my friends go to the hotel in Vegas that she's stayed at. I send them a picture. They've never met her. They start walking around the casino and um, my friends start sending me pictures of strangers. 
this kind of looks like your mom. Is this her? You know, and it's not. And eventually they find her. She's at a slot machine. She just, she loves slot machines and she gets stuck in a loop. She didn't know she needed to move on. So my friends find her. I also have a sister-in-law, my brother's wife's sister, who happens to now live in Vegas. And my mom has met her a few times. So we call her as well. So my friends just kind of keep an eye on her, wait till the known person comes. And then they get my mom to her room and get her bags. And I go to pick her up. And you can tell that she's not all there. We get her in the van and she's mad at us for coming. I, I would have gotten to you eventually, Billy. I uh, get her back to Southern Utah and it's this magical moment. Her mind comes back into full function and she spends a week holding her, her, grand, her great-grandson, her first great-grandchild, and spends a week with us. She insists on staying at a hotel. She wouldn't stay in our guest room. She's such a stubborn woman. And then uh, a month later, she falls and uh, doesn't regain consciousness for a moment. My dad makes the decision to put her in hospice. I fly back to Ohio again with my wife, and we watch my mom... Go from the day we got there, she was talking. I sang a song to her. She smiled. We chatted a minute. She got annoyed with something I said, which is exactly her. And then the next day she mumbled, but you could sort of understand. The next day she mumbled and you couldn't understand anything. And then the next day her eyes were closed. Her lips didn't move. And over the total of 11 days in hospice, she starved to death. And we live in this country where in most places around the world and here, we value the comfort of the living over the comfort of the dying. And we don't let people choose end of life measures so that we can end their suffering soon so that we who get to stay behind get to be more comfortable than them. And that process was horrific. And it led me to realizing that how we treat those who are dying in this country is one of the cruelest things we could do. Every human being with a terminal illness should have the right to end their life when they no longer want to be here. And no person, and, and, and people don't even get it. You're sitting in the room in hospice. It's day four. Your mom isn't moving her eyes or lips, but you don't know how conscious she, she still is. Um, as as Margie pointed out earlier, they say that listening, not early in this interview, but in, in a private conversation before the show started, that listening or hearing is might be the last thing to go. That's what the the medical community says, and you ought to assume that by the way, because what you don't understand if you've never been there is you sit in a room with your dying loved one. And as they're unable to respond, your brain starts to automatically forget that they're there. And you sit around with your loved one starting to have a conversation about how you're going to handle the funeral or how you're going to handle this part of the, the process or how you're going to handle that part. And then suddenly someone in the room goes, Oh, wait a minute, mom's right there. Who knows if she's listening or not, but sure as hell, she doesn't want to hear this conversation. And you realize that you're torturing her if she is listening. And then I remember sitting out of the hallway crying and thinking to myself, when no one's looking and everyone stepped out of the room, I'm going to walk back in the room with a pillow and suffocate my mom to death because it's the only way I know to end her suffering. So I sit for days thinking about how I can kill my mother so that she doesn't have to suffer anymore. And I asked my dad and my brother, and they're thinking the same damn thing. Um, what I learned in this process was that when you do spend time with someone at the end of life, if I can tell you one secret, it is to treat them and talk to them and interact with them as if it's just some other ordinary day. Because if you were dying and you were aware of it, the only real distraction is for everyone around you to pretend that life is normal. So we sat there the one night and we watched the Cleveland Browns game, which is a tr the thing we do in our home all of our life. And we screamed at the TV set and we talked to mom as we did it. I would go into the room at night and my dad would lay next to her every night. <clears throat> As she wasn't conscious, and I would just walk in the room and go, hey, mom and dad, how are you guys doing? Love you both. Give them both a hug. Give them both a kiss. Ask them how their day was. My dad would interact. Obviously, she wasn't able to. 
but I treated it as if it was just another day and this was life as normal because I have to imagine if you are conscious on any level, listening to what's going on around you, that that might be the only escape from the thoughts that are in your head that say that your death is imminent. And I, I couldn't be more adamant about all of those things. There was a moment every day in this hospice center, huge hospice center, the nursing staff was incredible. Every day in this center, they had a community room in the middle, and every day they would bring a performer in, and all the loved ones could essentially get away from their dying loved one and just kind of reground. And one day a guy came in and he just played the Native American flute. <laughs> And I just sat there for hours just trying to escape this thing that's happening that you can't get away from. We can do better. We can, because Oregon's already done it. We, we have nothing stopping us from simply, again, when we learn other people's experiences, we get to challenge our own patterns. So the moment you can sit with my story and learn, oh, I didn't know that, but that's what it's like. Now you can be a voice for change. And now we can change little by little every state to empower those who are, their death is eminent to be able on their own terms decide when they end their life rather than for our own comfort prolonging their suffering. Well, that is a beautiful story and very heartwarming and a passionate plea for, for physician-assisted end-of-life care. Jack Kevorkian wasn't an evil man, as religion told you. Jack Kevorkian was doing some of the most compassionate work on planet Earth. We want to certainly try to have things in place so that folks who feel hopeless, who could have resolved their hopelessness had they had the support, love, and encouragement, could do so. We don't want to give everyone the ability to just take their life. But when folks are, when life is anguish and misery and pain and suffering, and there is no hope that that can go away, we ought to respect that death might be, when we in religion say they're at peace now, might we take that literally? Man. Yeah. Um, so my understanding of what I know about hospice, I did work in a long-term facility for 15 years as a nurse's aide, is um, comfort care, which they give you morphine and roxanol, which shut your body down. So in essence, hospice to me is doing what Dr. Kevorkian did. So if we can give roxanol and morphine enough to slow all your functions down because you're at that point, you're dying. So why can't we, like Bill said, use euthanasia? Your person is already dying. This hospice facility was beautiful. If you were there for two to three days, six days, 10 days, 11 days, to be in a hospice unit is not okay. Uh, like he said, his bones starved to death because she cannot eat. And I slept in the next room while it happened. Why is that okay? To watch your mother starve to death when it's no problem to take your old sick dog to your get killed. We can do that to our pets, but we have to watch our parents or our loved one starve for 11 days. Doesn't matter, they're in a, the nicest facility. 11 days. You, you talk about hell, that was hell for every one of us in the family who stayed there and supported my mom and loved her in that process, it was hell. And the only thing that keeps us as a people doing it that way, if we go back to Buddhism, is our attachment to what is inevitably being lost anyway. Like grasping at something that you have no control and is ending no matter how hard you grasp and yet for your own attachment, it, it prolongs to a point where you allow the person you care about to suffer so that you get a few more minutes with them 
or so that you don't get as uncomfortable or disturbed. Yeah, thank you so much for sharing. And I'm so, so sorry. Yeah, thank you. I, I have, I've talked a bit on, you know, different podcasts about um, the death of my my dad, and there are some similarities. There are definitely similar thoughts. I did a deep dive uh, while he was dying and after. And one book that if, if people are taking care of parents um, who you can see are on the decline, or it's coming, it's coming for all of us. <laughs> it's just what I have yeah. to say. But there's a book called Being Mortal by Atul Gawande. He's a, a doctor. He has won numerous awards for his past books, one for complications. Anyway, Being Mortal, which discusses kind of end of life as well as the medical system's failure um, to acknowledge end of life care and even in its training this um, strong preference to keep life going at all costs that that's actually their training and starting to question a lot of those things it's very it's a beautiful book I actually read it while uh, my dad was starting to fail I found it comforting um, so that's a that's a read just a, a reference point if uh, you're interested but Mm -hmm. Anyway, so many of the same thoughts, and mm. I'm so, so sorry. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks to both, all of you. Um, and Bill, just because we're we're coming close to the end of, of today's episode, uh, let me <clears throat> um, let me just inquire a little bit further. You've made it a passion to plea for ethical end of life care. What about just generically the idea that religion claims to take away the sting of death? Death's not sad because of religion. Religion tells you not only that there is an afterlife, which plugs that hole, but it also tells you it's going to be amazing with a few conditions. You don't have that. You don't even know if there's going to be an afterlife. You may be an atheist and not even believe in an afterlife, which means that for you, Maybe you don't even, maybe you have a surety that there won't be an afterlife. There are all sorts of people that are like, that's not a benefit. That's not a bonus. That's trading backwards. That's going backwards. That's giving up something really valuable. So how, how do you respond to people who say that's one of the benefits of religion is resolutions about death? And you ain't got nothing for that, atheist, you know? Yeah. So my rebuttal would be that in religion, with all the things you busy yourself about in order to set yourself up to take advantage of that gorgeous afterlife, what you end up doing is treating the present as if it's the past because you're so focused on the past and the future. And, and so in Mormonism, for instance, you we talk about how important families are, but as a as a leader in the church, I was almost never around my family. And I, and I justified it by saying, I'm building the kingdom now, and I'll spend my time with my family in eternity. And so now, having deconstructed all of that, I am deeply aware that all I have is the present moment. The past is a memory. The future never comes. All you have is now. And I live my fullest life in each present moment, the best I can, I'm very aware of what that is. I think about death. I meditate on death. I'll sit and watch a show or a movie. I'll see a, a death happen, and I'll let my brain for four or five minutes just wander off and contemplate my own ending. And, I, and for most of us, um, that ending uh, is going to be in such a form that it's certainly not going to be pleasant. But whether we whether we think about it or don't think about it, it's happening regardless. I don't ever find myself depressed in that meditation. It actually calls on me to be more aware and present in the living moments that I have. And so while the religionist might say the things you just noted, John, I would argue that I am living a much more vibrant, full, alive life by being aware that maybe this all comes to an end and there isn't anything on the other side. And for those who are like terrified at the prospects of letting go of God, basically, 
and letting go of heaven and the resurrection and the afterlife, I'm sure in their minds they can't imagine ever feeling at peace, let alone like they've traded up, giving up um, God in an afterlife for the now. I think unless you've really done the work and done the work to become comfortable and even to like the idea of focusing on the now, and I agree that's what brings, you, you give up something that may or may not be true that's in the future for the chance to optimize what what is sure, which is what you have in the present moment. Like that's the benefit. I'm with you on that. How can he, any of you give consolation to those who feel like there's no way I'm going to feel better about my existence, a, adopting a focus on the now when I'm giving up reassurances about the afterlife? Every one of us is scared because the system told us to fear what happens if we let go of belief. We've been prompted, inoculated, uh, uh, taught, and programmed to think that losing our faith would end with such horrible things happening. And life is messy, whether you're religious or not. What I know is that all we ever have our entire life is the present moment, and everything else is a mirage. Amanda, anything you want to add? No, I think that summed it up pretty good. Margie, any questions or follow up? No? Mm -mm. Okay. Okay. Well, that is, I mean, for many, that is the big question. That's what drives belief in God, drives religion, drives commitment, is death and the afterlife and heaven and all that. So, didn't you fear that? At one time, what would happen if you lost it all? Oh, yeah, of course. And now looking at it from where you're at, having both perspectives, was it as scary as you were taught to think it was? I mean, what I realized is once I started pulling on the thread of religious certainty and the, the things that I had been taught that turned out to be false, I realized that I had the illusion of certainty, that like... I could feel pacified by some story that someone told me about God in an afterlife. But did I really know it was real? It could have just been as made up as the golden plates and Angel Moroni yeah. and, and the Book of Abraham. So what I realized is I wasn't really giving up certainty. I was giving up the illusion of certainty. And what I was trading for the illusion of certainty that wasn't real was like 10% of my income and many, many hours a week, not to mention the constant guilt and shame and fear and all these duties and obligations that really are building up a quarter of a trillion dollar organization at the expense of my remaining time on this earth. Yeah. So like, I, I feel like I gained everything and lost nothing because what I was believing in was an illusion. Yeah. Now, some people feel like that's fine. If it's an illusion that makes you feel better, go with the illusion. And that goes back to this question about happy. There is a there is a sense of kind of illusory happiness, kind of like blind ignorance, foolish happiness, where you just don't know better, and so you're happy. But I don't want to live in that world. No. I don't want to live in that existence. No. For me, an, an unexamined life isn't worth living, probably. Or it's less worth living than an examined life that's as rooted in reality as possible. And for me, that's what informed consent is about. That's what Mormon story is about. I think that's what Mormon, um, uh, Mormonism Live and Mormon discussion and what you're trying to do in your life mission is about is helping people stand in reality and live their best life with, with the time they have left, right? I've never felt more alive. Yeah. Yeah. That's not a bad quote to end with. Margie? Yeah, let's go with it. Yeah. Amanda? I agree. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Amen. Amen. Can amen. I get an amen? Amen. <laughs> amen. 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 All right. Well, Bill and Amanda Real, we did it. You did the nine whatever Look hour Mama Stories interview. What do you think? I'll tell you, it I hope it's helpful. I hope that someone resonates with the things we talked about in each of the three episodes and that it's helpful to folks feeling empowered 
to be a better version of themselves and a more honest version of themselves. And I also hope that you find contentment and happiness in doing that. Thanks, my brother. And I just want to say on behalf of a huge progressive and post-Mormon community, tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of people, you both have played a crucial role mm -hmm. in so many people's journeys and awakenings. And I just, on behalf of this community, I brought you here primarily to honor and thank you for your contributions. Because while I know you love what you do, it also comes at a great personal sacrifice. Yeah. Yeah. So thank you. You're welcome. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks, Amanda. Thank you. And I am just, I am in, in awe of you guys and of of the supporters. Um, and so thank you yeah. to you and Margie. And thank you for supporters of all of us working together to strive for betterness. Yeah. yeah. Love it. Thank you. And uh, hopefully we'll honor you guys tonight. And we plan on recording tonight and then releasing it later as well. But I hope we have a, I hope we have a great evening tonight. It'll be fun. And um, yeah, and then just end by telling everyone about the Mormon Discussions Network and how people can support you and all the worthy endeavors yeah. that you sponsor. Because it's not just you. And believe it or not, it's not just Radio Free Mormon. There's more. Yeah. So tell people how they can support you. Yep. So you go to Mormon Discussions with an S on the end, dot org. On that landing page, you will see the uh, listing of podcasts, thumbnails of podcasts that we offer. There are most of them deal with facets of Mormonism. Uh, but we even have podcasts such as the Almost Awakened podcast that really sort of avoids as much as possible talking about Mormonism and really uh, helping folks with kind of second half of life tools, uh, reference there to Richard Rohr. Um, you can go to mormondiscussionpodcast.org. That will have the audio content of all of our podcast. And then every podcast has its own unique website where if you just want to be a fan or follower of any particular one, such as Radio Free Mormon, Rami Umptum Ruminations or others, you can do that. Um, I would also suggest our YouTube channel. If you go on YouTube and look for Mormon Discussion uh, INC Incorporated, uh, you'll find our channel. You can subscribe and follow there. Uh, we would deeply appreciate uh, you coming on board as a subscriber, and you'll see all of our content there for the host that most of them who are publishing their content to YouTube. And uh, I just hope that our content is helpful uh, to you on your journey, regardless of where you're at. Beautiful. All right. Thanks, Bill. Thanks, Amanda. Thank you, my friends. I hope you, I wish you both health, happiness, and prosperity yeah. in what you do. Did it back and, at the two of you. And if you de at least several decades of continued financial success and yeah. sustainability in what you do. Love it. Thank you, Mo. Thanks, Amanda. Thank you. Thanks, Margie. So great to have you. My pleasure. All right. Yeah. All right. Thanks, everyone. Please support uh, Bill and go to mormondiscussions.org. Mm -hmm. And please provide them with your financial support. And um, also your subscriptions to Mormonism Live and to their YouTube channel. Uh, help us, helps, and Facebook, their Facebook group, mm -hmm. all that helps with the algorithms, helps to get them, um, you know, out there. So please support them in all the ways. Thanks to everyone who supports Mormon Stories and the Open Stories Foundation. We couldn't do this without you. So again, thanks for all that. Please be good to each other. Please be kind to each other. And uh, we'll see you all again soon on another episode of Mormon Stories Podcast and on Mormon Discussion Podcast and on Mormonism Live Wednesday nights. <laughs> 6.20 p.m. Mountain Time, YouTube. Take care, everybody. And RFM, at the end of the day, it's really all about you. So. <laughs> True? It is. <laughs>